And we're live? Yep. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Heads Up Can Concussion webinar. My name is Seth Mendelson. And I'm Ryan Sutton. And we are the co-founders of the Heads Up Concussion Advocacy Network, but we're also going to be your MCs for tonight's event. Now, as people are still going to be joining in since we did, oh, we started two minutes early. My computer said to say. So as people are still joining in now, either way, um, we're gonna take this time to tell you a bit more about our story and why we want to put together this event that solely focuses on the topic of concussions. So my name is Ryan Sutton and I'm the co-founder, executive director, and chair of Heads Up Concussion Advocacy Network. We are very, very excited to be here today with all of you, and we are excited to also bring you into our world and share a bit of our passion for concussion awareness with all of you. But first, I'm gonna break into my concussion story and why I'm so passionate about this. Um, so basically, when I was eight years old, I had my first concussion, and it came in a big bike accident where I actually was knocked out for upwards of 30 minutes and woke up at a hospital not knowing what I was doing or what happened. All I knew that I was in distress. And since then, I've had five more. And actually, it was my fifth one um, in 2016 that kind of started all this. Um, when I was sitting there, I didn't really know what I was going through. I know I've been through a few before, but this one was so much worse. The fifth one for me was just so much worse than the others. And I started to realize that there wasn't really any communities online that I could join and that I could feel a part of something bigger. And actually just for me to understand better what I was going through. Um, so then I started to then talk with Seth about this and a few other friends and just telling them about my experience and how there wasn't really anything out there that had this type of inclusive atmosphere where people were communicating and exp explaining what they're going through with concussions. And then from there, Seth basically. Yeah, so away. basically when Ryan told me about his experience with concussions, it really made me reflect on my own experience. and. I was only diagnosed with one concussion. I experienced it in my senior year playing football. I actually got it two weeks before the season started, but, and it was deemed as a mild concussion, but it actually took me out for nearly half the season. And for me, I had this very alienating feeling that came from this experience. Um, it was tough because in my recovery process, I was able to get back to school pretty quickly but I didn't feel ready to play football again and to be in a class and to see my teammates not being able to be on the field with them. It created this really tough emotional strain on me. And, you know, thankfully I was very fortunate enough to have a really strong supporting cast, but even for them, they couldn't really resonate with what I was going through. So like Ryan said, we started this in our final year at Brock university. Uh, we're both sport management alumni students and we really rallied behind the idea of challenging the stigma. And this became our mission. And what you'll notice from pretty much any video that we share or anything that we post, this message is always incorporated because to us, it's something that we truly believe in. When you think about concussions, there is this huge stigmatization for the people that are going through the injury because not everyone can understand how severe this injury is. So some of the ways that we challenge the stigma are through our social media. We post content every day that we hope is unique and, and engaging with our community. Um, we also put together events like this. So if you're joining in now, we're just kind of telling a little bit more about our story and we appreciate all of you having here, but it's really important for us to bring people into this conversation and have them learn and get educated from industry export, experts and other people about the severity of this injury. Um, we also have our own apparel that represents everything that we stand for, as well as our advocates program that Ryan will touch upon a bit later. Now, that's the ways that we challenge the stigma, but how can you challenge the stigma? And there's really three core principles when, when we're talking about this and how you can be involved in this movement. Now, the first one is empathy. Having an empathetic approach to anyone going through a concussion recovery is essential for their process. 
even if you can't resonate with what they're going through, being there for them is really big and, and it shows that you really do care. And it's something that we really try and talk a lot about and, and educate everyone so that you can be there for your loved ones. The second one is communication. If you're dealing with a concussion, being open and vulnerable with what you're going through can actually lead to some incredible breakthroughs in your recovery process. And it is a tough thing to do, but sharing your symptoms is actually something that you might be surprised by how everyone else resonates and is there for you. But communication is a two-way street. So that's also looking at people who know someone that suffered from a concussion and just being there for them, sending them a message, or just checking in those, those small things that we can do, especially in a pandemic when you can't be around your loved ones is really something that can help the person going through their recovery. And then finally, advocacy, advocating for each other, advocating for yourself, sharing your story and talking about this invisible injury and raising more awareness is crucial in the large game of challenging the stigma. And now to talk about our advocate program. So as you may have noticed, we started this program uh, back in April and we actually have upwards of 50 plus people registered in it right now. And we're just really excited about the potential of this, uh, of this uh, program. And basically what we like to do is find new ways for these amazing advocates to share their experiences with concussion. So as you may have seen um, this past month in our awareness month campaign, uh, we, at, we showed you guys um, quotes, tips and treatment options that our advocates have uh, experienced when they're going through their recovery. And this is a very important part because it allows us to show the different ways and different perspectives that people go through a concussion. And we don't necessarily want to say there's one specific way to go through a concussion. We actually are trying to attempt to paint a picture of the variety of different ways that people go through this injury. So there's more awareness on the different aspects of it. And honestly, we are, this is one of our favorite ways to spread awareness. And we think this is one of our best programs that we've ever built. And we are excited to build upon the progress that we've made so far. Absolutely, it's really exciting. And we've really crafted the first three weeks of this Concussion Awareness Month um, through our advocates. So we wanna thank all of them for being willing to share their stories um, and what helped them. And if you wanna know anything more about us, uh, you can check our website, www.headsofcan.ca and learn a little bit more. But we're gonna move ahead and show you what we've got in store for you tonight. So we're going to start with some incredible industry experts about exploring the holistic approach to concussion recovery. And then we're going to follow that up with some amazing concussion advocates, all of which um, have played at a very high level of hockey. And we're going to look to challenge the stigma surrounding concussions in sports. So we're really excited about these two panelists. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a really fun night. And now for this is a special announcement just finalized today, but we have a collaboration project in the works with the Ontario Brain Injury Association and the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. We are extremely proud to be announcing this. And uh, basically the program is gonna be built around a six part video and podcast series that'll be set in a support group setting. So we'll be looking for a focus group type of thing where we're gonna facilitate conversations um, with people who have experienced a concussion and breaking down the various aspects of the injury through these amazing conversations. And now actually we will be bringing in Judy Gergero from the ONF and she will be explaining a little bit more of uh, what this program is gonna look like and the gaps that it's gonna fill uh, within the industry. Hi, Judy. Thanks a lot, Ryan and Seth. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be joining in and I'm, I'm not gonna speak too long because as Ryan and Seth have noted, you have an incredible set of panels um, uh, to keep you entertained and informed uh, for the next little bit. But at ONF really, um, our role is to be the honest broker of, of research evidence. And uh, we've, we've found, just like I'm sure all of you have found, that there is, there's a wide range of misinformation that's out there, including stigma about concussion. And there's a couple of ways of addressing this. And one of the ways is to put out guidelines, clinical best practice guidelines. And so that's what we do at ONF. And we also have some standards of care. So just to 
plug our resources because as much as we're speaking to clinicians um, and healthcare providers, we're also speaking to the persons with lived experience and their family members. So we have uh, concussionsontario.org is one website and braininjuryguidelines.org is another. So that's where you can find the evidence-based uh, concussion information. So the reason why I'm really happy to partner with Heads Up and the Ontario Brain Injury Association on this initiative is because there's a real gap of information that's meant for persons with lived experience or the sort of non-healthcare provider audience. And I think it's really important um, that people get access to evidence-based information that helps them to make decisions around how to manage their concussion, where to look for, for treatment, who to consider, you know, what are, what are those treatment options, who should be providing those, those treatments. So in our six-part series, we're going to kind of cover, cover the range from diagnosis, um, specific return to activity, um, but also living a life of a person after a concussion and some, some strategies around that. So the Ontario Brain Injury Association uh, is, is a very good advocacy organization. They have uh, a peer support program. They have an online support group for folks after concussion, and they... Um, they reach across the province. And so we're happy to sort of partner with them and heads up, uh, we're hoping to have a broad reach and we're hoping this will just be the first um, uh, series that we're going to do because obviously there's a lot more than six topics that are important and that we hope this will be really valuable because it'll be that person with lived experience really getting across to other people the important elements and speaking with key clinicians around the evidence that supports um, what you should be doing for diagnosis, treatment, and management. So thank you very much for, for having me speak on this subject today. Yeah, thanks, Judy. Thanks for uh, chiming in and explaining a bit more of the program. And we're really, really excited um, to continue to work together on this. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So at this point, Ryan's actually going to leave us, um, but he will be very active in the chat. And it's, we're really excited because we want to keep you guys engaged throughout this. So we have uh, some really awesome social media giveaways. Uh, there will be contests throughout the entire webinar. Uh, so make sure you're following the chat below as Ryan will be interacting with all of you there. Um, we've got some incredible organizations that are part of this. We want to thank Shop Dresser, the Athletes Podcast, and the Athletic Eatery. I mean, you guys got the chance to win um, free merchandise from Shop Dresser. Uh, the Athletes Podcast has a bunch of merchandise from Popeyes, and Athletic Eatery was kind enough to bring in their alkaline water, as well as two free sessions at Redline Athletics Canada. Uh, so all of this um, will be brought to you through Ryan in the chat, so make sure you're keeping your eye open. And we also want to take this moment to thank our event partner, um, the Brock University Student Union. This is, a, I mean, Brock is near and dear to Ryan and I's hearts. We literally created this entire organization. It's crazy to think how far we've come um, as students at Brock. And, you know, we've been actually been working with BUSU since the beginning of the year to put together an event. And you know, at the time, the plan was to actually come to the school and, and do stuff there. But given this pandemic, obviously, that wasn't going to be the case. Um, but we were able to kind of look past that and adapt to this new normal and put together this event, which we are incredibly, incredibly excited for. So we are going to start to bring in our first panel, the moment you guys have all been waiting for. And we're really looking forward to breaking down some really amazing conversations with all of these speakers. And while we're waiting for that, I just want to get a little show of hands. Um, you can click it at the bottom. Who has ever experienced a concussion before? And just quickly click the show of hands at the bottom there. I mean, this injury is honestly something that it's really tough to explain what you're going through. So we're really looking forward, um, obviously, given, you know, the fact that this is a pandemic and everyone's adjusting to this. Um, if stuff does go wrong, we do apologize in advance. 
Um, but this is something that we've been really looking forward to all month because these conversations are essential. Um, they're really important to challenging the stigma, to getting that discussion going. Um, so we're going to be bringing in the speakers now, but, but if you have questions, if you have anything that you want to mention, just again, put it at the bottom here. Um, and Ryan will do the best to get to all of that. And we are working on getting all yeah. of the panelists. Hi, Natasha. There you go, unmute, hello. <laughs> all right, oh, we got everyone. Awesome, how are you all doing? Good. Good, Excellent. good, yeah. awesome. <laughs> all right, so let's just get right into it. Now, we're gonna be looking at the conversation of the holistic approach to concussion recovery. And what we refer to when we talk about this is not just one aspect of concussion recovery, but the entire process. So whether you're establishing national protocols, you're researching the psychological effects of concussions, or you're dealing with patients on a daily basis, in order for a full recovery to happen, all of these need to coexist. So with that being said, and we'll start with you, Stephanie McFarland. I've got to make sure I say the last name here because we got two Stephanies. What, and we're going to, this question is going to be available open to everyone. What do you, what brought you into the field of concussions? And, and if you can explain a little bit more about why you wanted to help people and how you help people dealing with concussions. Um, thanks, Seth. Um, hopefully my audio is okay. I'm not sure if my internet's going in and out, so maybe flag me if I'm not. Um, does it sound okay? Yeah, you're good. Great, okay. So um, in terms of how I got interested in concussion, I did my master's in occupational therapy um, at U of T. Um, I kind of just honestly fell into the field, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, I didn't really seek out concussion. Um, it, I just had a placement in it, and it was an area of interest. Um, I was an athlete my whole life. I really like uh, working with conditions and health areas that have a holistic approach and have a variety of approaches. I've always been attracted to brain injury in general and mental health. So I would say that's um, how I kind of came into the field. Awesome. And then I guess we'll just go to the next Stephanie and, and we'll kind of make our way around. Sure. Um, similar kind of story, not something I planned to end up working with, but so thrilled to be that I am where I am. Um, I have been working in injury prevention for a while. Um, I started at uh, Parachute as a coordinator for Ontario, supporting different practitioners across the province in a range of injury prevention topics, um, working with healthcare, working with public health, uh, people running local community programs. When Parachute received funding to begin the concussion harmonization project and, and really dive into making a difference in the concussion space, um, I was given the opportunity to be project manager on that project. And that's where things took a deeper dive for me. I knew a little bit about concussion, but um, that gave me the opportunity to basically have a full-time job looking at this information and connecting with different stakeholders. Um, we're so fortunate in Canada to have the amazing experts, um, clinicians and researchers that we have. So that's made it such a wonderful experience. Um, I've loved getting to work more with the sports sector. Um, also, I've been involved in sport my whole life. I'm a big sport fan. And it, so it's been wonderful to uh, be able to tap into that passion of mine. Um, as well, um, you know, we have wonderful practitioners on the panel today. They're all phenomenal people and it's just a pleasure to learn from them. Um, and of course, those who have experienced injury, um, whether it's concussion or other injury topics, the families I've met, the people I met that are taking their experiences and helping others is, what keeps you passionate along the way? You know, when people try and say, maybe we're taking concussion too seriously, or we're trying to do too much. I hear people's stories and, and it renews my energy to say, no, we're, we're doing the right things. So I'm, I never would have planned uh, being here where I am today, but I'm so thankful that I am. Awesome. And then we'll go to Keith and then finish it off with Natasha. Sure. Uh, first, thanks to Ryan and Seth for the invitation uh, to be part of this event tonight. Uh, tonight for the East Coast till the afternoon. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I'm a neuropsychologist by training. Uh, so, uh, and I'm a lot older than the other panelists. 
So uh, 25 years ago, roughly, uh, I was already doing research in traumatic brain injury in kids, uh, but in my clinical practice, I was having uh, kids referred to me uh, who came into my office and they had a history of uh, concussion. And most of the literature at that point said that this was a benign injury. Uh, that in fact, back in the day, we used kids with concussion as our comparison group uh, because it was thought they didn't have any effects so we could compare them to the kids with the more serious traumatic brain injuries. Uh, but the kids who were coming to my office quite clearly had persistent problems after what were regarded as these benign injuries. And um, I went to the research literature and I tried to find um, out more about that. And at that point, there was really very little in the way of uh, research on concussion in kids, uh, a bit more on adults. Uh, and uh, um, I became intrigued by that uh, because of some of the arguments that were in the uh, literature on adults about is it all psychological? Is there a real brain injury? Uh, the, the psychogenic versus uh, uh, physiogenic debate that's, that's kind of been in, part of the concussion landscape for many years and just decided to try to do something about that myself. So. Uh, uh, got involved and, and was fortunate enough to get a grant from the National Institutes of Health uh, to do one of the first longitudinal studies with kids with, uh, with mild TBI or concussion and really try to begin to understand uh, the outcomes better because we need that information to inform good clinical care. And that's really where the, the voyage started. And I was lucky enough to get recruited at the University of Calgary about six years ago uh, and uh, uh, really became involved in coordinating uh, the integrated concussion research program that's uh, here at the UC, and then fortunately began to make many, many connections nationally. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit later about the uh, Canadian Concussion Network that we're, uh, we're just starting get, uh, getting started this year. Awesome. And Natasha? Well, hello, thank you for having me. Um, I'm also on the West Coast, so it's the afternoon for me too. <laughs> um, so similar to the other ladies on the panel too, concussion, kind of fell onto my lap. So I opened a neurological clinic, physiotherapy clinic in my city in Nanaimo and people knew me as the neuro person. And at that point I was really treating predominantly stroke and spinal cord and MS and Parkinson's. And um, finally there was an occupational therapist in town and she called me and she said, I'm gonna refer you someone because she had a concussion from a car accident and she's not getting better and you're the brain person. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, <laughs> so I had this wonderful concussion client and I'll never forget her. Um, and I was initially moving a little blind, like going back through my PT textbooks of like, okay, what happens here? What happens here? Um, but it seriously struck an interest in me. And I am always that person who, if I don't know something, I'm immediately looking for a course or something so that I can learn to serve my clients. Um, and it opened up the rabbit hole. And I dove in head first and haven't looked back. And that was probably about four years ago now. Um, and just continuing to study as much as I can, both within my profession, but within other professions to have, when you talk about that holistic care, to have that understanding of the scope of what we need to understand to help serve our clients, whether I'm the one providing the treatment or not. So it's a, uh, I now like my clinic is dedicated predominantly to concussion. My online business is one of my online businesses is dedicated to concussion. I know we're going to talk about that later. So, but yeah, I love every aspect of it. And luckily thank that occupational therapist every day that she referred that client to me because if she hadn't, I don't know where I would be right now. Awesome. And you know, you're all individuals that have devoted your life to helping others. And it's honestly, it's truly inspiring. And especially for an organization like ours, like it's, it, it makes us want to be a part of this positive impact. And so for a lot of you, this kind of just fell into your lap. But what has kept you involved in wanting to stay in the field of concussions from when it fell to, to now? And, and we'll start with Natasha and, and go around. It's the clients. Legitimately, like it is that moment. I'll never forget it. So I had a client who I worked with who I didn't like we discharged him because he was doing really well. And he sent me an email one day and I opened it up and it was him with a photo standing in front of his big rig. And he was just like, thank you for everything you did because I can go back and do this again. And I started bawling. <laughs> 
I'm that practitioner that like happy dances and claps and cries. It's ridiculous. Sure. Um, but getting to be able to, I love that connection you get with your clients, seeing the impact you can have to help someone get their quality of life back to help them reach their goals again. But then beyond that, the people that come into my clinic are a lot of those people who have persistent symptoms, who really struggle to find healthcare to support them. And so wanting to be part of the, I guess the movement that we're all trying to do to increase that education, to increase that awareness so that people have a better understanding of this diagnosis and this injury so that they don't end up ideally dealing with these persistent symptoms. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And then Keith, yourself? Yeah, the patients are what got me started. Uh, but you know, the thing, I'm, I'm one of these people, I hate not knowing things. And, and it was that curiosity of not knowing the right thing to say to my patients, not being able to give them good advice, um, not knowing really what um, promoted good recovery, what didn't promote good recovery, who was at risk, who wasn't. Uh, and uh, sometimes just sideline conversations. Both of my daughters, who are now adults, were uh, um, competitive athletes. And it was interesting over the years from when they started when they were very young, as they moved into high school, um, concussion became increasingly a topic on the sidelines. And again, hearing from parents, and of course, some of their teammates would get concussions and I'd get these questions because they knew I was a neuropsychologist, like, what can we expect? It was that ongoing uncertainty for me and the fascination, the thing about concussion that is so interesting to me, both in terms of patients and then intellectually, um, is this, every concussion is a little different. The blend of, of the biology, the brain part of it, but then the, the, the environmental and psychological piece of it. And to really understand concussion, I mean, you use the word holistic. Um, you really need a holistic biopsychosocial model to understand what happens to people with concussion, and we're still trying to get there. So it's it's that trying to get answers to to a really complex problem that's really common. That was the other piece of it for me, as I had started out in more severe brain injury, which to, um, fortunately has become much less common in kids because we've done things like gotten better. Uh, safer cars and car seats. So we've cut down severe brain injury in kids significantly in the last 20 years. But concussion on the other side has gone up because kids are more engaged in sport and we're getting better at diagnosing it and find seeing it's there. So it's a really common problem, has persistent difficulties for a number of problems and just is a really challenging disorder. No, for sure. And Stephanie Cowell? I was waiting to hear what last name was. <laughs> uh, um, a, a couple of things. Um, in, in the work that I do in injury prevention, and particularly um, parachute in our position as, as a national leader and that's a, a connector and working towards policy and advocacy and, and getting information out, we don't often get a, a chance to see real immediate impact for our work. We often have to, you know, wait for years or just recognize that we're making a contribution that adds to others and ultimately will make a difference. Concussion is a space where I've actually been able to see that impact in a relatively short period of time. And that's so amazing and so rewarding as a professional to, to know that you can connect the dots back to the work that you're doing and the partners that you're working with. So that's been an incredible driver for me. Um, you know, the project, uh, our concussion harmonization project started on a bit of a smaller scale um, than we even wanted to in the beginning. And it's just grown and grown and grown. So, so to see more people come into the fold and be able to add more to it, um, it just it just keeps getting better. And so, so that's why I feel real passionate about this work. And while I've gone on to, um, to add other projects onto my plate, concussion is still very central to what I do. Awesome. And we'll definitely touch a bit more about the concussion harmonization project that you led. And then finally, Stephanie McFarland, take us away on this question. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like uh, people who work in concussion definitely have a personality type because for all the same reasons um, my, my fellow <laughs> panelists have stated. Um, yeah, it's, it's for the clients, it's for the families. They keep you coming and wanting to improve yourself. Um, also, the fact that every single client you see is different from the last one you saw. You never get comfortable in the field of concussion. You're constantly learning. 
And I think the only other thing I would add is um, kind of to speak to what Judy was talking about earlier, um, really like best practice in concussion is, is still yet to be well understood. And I think as myself and some of my fellow panelists here, being some of the few who are, are, are getting that best practice out there and making efforts to increase the evidence, I also sometimes feel almost a sense of duty, as <laughs> lame as that sounds, uh, to, to ensure that um, the right care is being provided out there for kids, families, and adults. No, absolutely. And it's so essential with this injury. I mean, this is the brain. Like, we can't play around with this. And I mean, we've heard so many horrible stories of people not getting the right care and prolonging their symptoms. So now I'm going to kind of break down into some individual questions, and then we'll circle back to the group. Uh, I just want to kind of get more specific areas of concussion recovery and kind of get those conversations going. So I'm going to start with you, Keith. I mean, you have over 200 publications, and your most recent research look to take a comprehensive approach to the different outcomes associated with concussion. So can you touch a little bit upon why you decided to focus on this area of research? I know you talked about the neurobiological and the psychosocial factors. So what about that drove you to this research and to wanting to explore more about it? Yeah, I've always been interested in, in how the brain works and, and uh, uh, how we understand uh, people's functioning and, and hopefully that'll help us, uh, you know, help people. The thing that, uh, you know, when I started doing work in this area, we just didn't know sort of what are the things that make a difference after concussion? Uh, what's the underlying nature of the injury? How does what a person brings to the injury affect their recovery from the injury? How do environmental factors, particularly for kids in terms of their home environment and their parenting and other things affect their recovery? And we certainly had a sense clinically in, in working, with, uh, working with patients that all those things came uh, into play, but we didn't have much in the way of actual literature uh, research to tell us how those things made a difference, which ones are more important. Um, and um, there has been this, this longstanding sort of uh, debate in concussion in the research uh, community, but also in the clinical community. Like, is it a real injury? Uh, is there a brain injury there or not? Uh, maybe it's all psychological. And, and it always struck me that a lot of that discussion was sort of treating it as if one of those had to be true, when in fact, my assumption all along was they're both true. There, there's an injury that can be along a continuum uh, from very, very modest to more severe. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, uh, psychological environmental factors that can both hinder and, uh, and facilitate recovery from the injury. And um, a lot of the research that was getting done wasn't really taking both sides of the equation in, into account. So my, my work is always set out to try to balance that by um, acknowledging that we need to understand the underlying injury uh, better but also take into account the psychological and social factors that play such a big role uh, in folks' recovery. Be and, and the importance of the psychological and social stuff is that we don't really know how to fix the brain. I mean, re reality is we don't. Mm -hmm. And there's no medication that works for concussion. I mean, you may treat certain symptoms with, with medication or other medical interventions, but the most effective interventions are actually on the behavioral and social side. So as we understand those risk factors better, that's not to negate the injury because the injury is real, but we may be able to more effectively uh, facilitate people's recovery on the behavioral and social side. So my research has just tried to really um, take to heart of the need for a biopsychosocial model uh, and in kids make that a developmental biopsychosocial model to really understand uh, the outcomes of the injuries and then use that information uh, to promote better management and better treatment. I mean, it's incredible because you're, I mean, it completely falls into the conversation of the holistic approach of looking at all these different factors. And even today, like when we are talking with people on the front lines, there's this linkage of people where it's like concussions, headaches, migraines, but, but we know it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. So where are you in terms of your research now? And what are some of the next steps for your research? Well, you know, we, we, uh, followed up uh, studies I'd done before coming to Canada with a really large study uh, that we concluded about a year ago. Uh, nearly a thousand children in the study from five different uh, emergency departments across Canada working with an organization called Pediatric Emergency Research Canada, which is a collection of all the academic um, emergency departments across Canada. 
And we're just really starting to, to look at this data, but we're, we're finding some very interesting um, results. Uh, we're looking at things like psychological resilience and social support as important factors <clears throat> in promoting recovery. Uh, so we've got some, some interesting work going on there. We're looking at some very interesting things about sex differences and the role of, of uh, puberty. Uh, as potentially uh, affecting recovery. There's a lot of talk about sex differences out in the community right now in terms of responses to concussion, but relatively little data uh, that actually addresses the, the issue. And, and so I think we're gonna be able to uh, make some real valuable contributions there. We also got some amazing, we have the largest neuroimaging um, database in the world on concussion in kids now in Calgary from the study. We had a, about 850 kids who had MRIs when they first were injured, and then most of them got follow-up MRIs. So we got some pretty exciting, um, I think, findings that we're going to get from that in terms of both its ability to see if imaging really can help us diagnostically, but also whether it'll predict outcomes. But ultimately, and this takes time, um, we want to take both of those. We want to take what we're learning again from the biology. We also have all the genetic data on these kids because there's clearly probably a role for genetic variation and who responds to brain injury well and who doesn't. Uh, so we want to take all that information about sort of the neurobiology and then the information about some of these psychosocial factors to really begin to get a sense of how much does that account for injury. Um, there's a really big study in Canada that was done, uh, that I was part of, I didn't direct, that developed a very um, useful prediction rule to be used in the emergency department with kids to predict who's gonna have persistent symptoms and who isn't. And what we're looking to do is take our research and improve on that so we're even better. So a, a physician or a clinician when they're presented with a, with a patient, a child with a concussion can tell parents more accurately what the likelihood is that they're gonna recover as opposed to have persistent problems. The next step really to, to, to answer, ultimately answer your question, um, is to take what we're learning and begin to develop interventions because the biggest gap in the research uh, area about concussion now is about treatment. Uh, we've really did, learned a lot about the injury. We've learned a lot about recovery and the factors that predict it, but there are only a handful of clinical trials that have actually been done in concussion. So we're still largely relying on expert judgment and consensus about what are the things that can really promote recovery and, and we need more clinical trials. And I think our research provides some clues as to where we might target those sorts of uh, trials to, to really begin to learn what works and what doesn't. That's awesome. And I feel like I can speak for everyone listening. We're really excited to see where those findings lead you and how you go with those next steps. Now, on top of being this incredible researcher, you also are the executive chair of the Canadian Concussion Network. So can you tell people a bit about what inspired the CCN and some of the main objectives for this initiative? Yeah, um, I'm really excited about this. And this is really a team effort. Steph is uh, one of our uh, uh, coordinators and we partner in the parachute in the Canadian Concussion Network. The notion was basically that we have 80 to 100 researchers active in Canada that are really focused on concussion and their research program. But a lot of the research happens in silos and individuals. There hasn't been a real effort to develop a national research agenda uh, that we can then go to uh, funders were to say, this is what we think we can do well in Canada and really support as a, at a national level. So whether they be uh, clinical trials that involve multiple sites or large scale research in other areas, um, the notion was that Canada really punches above its weight uh, in terms of the academic uh, research side and concussion, but we could do even more if we came together. So we really got this tremendous uh, support from, from uh, a national range of researchers. But what's different about the Canadian Concussion Network is that from the very beginning, we're seeing it as a knowledge translation and patient engagement network as well. So we've got this tremendous group of researchers, but we're really trying to reach out to all the stakeholders in concussion and patient organizations in concussion so that they help us shape the research agenda. We're um, one initiative that we started in concert with ONF, with Judy's help uh, uh, and uh, uh, with Parachute's involvement is a priority setting partnership. This is a, a very structured um, process by which you use patients and clinicians uh, input and they tell us what are their top 10 priorities for research. And it's priorities that we don't have answers for. 
So right from the beginning, what we want to do is find out what are the what are the patients and clinicians and stakeholders care about? What are the questions they have that we don't have answers for? And then look to see what this tremendous network of researchers and concussion are doing, what their skills are, and what can Canada do that's unique at a national level to really push the, uh, the concussion research uh, agenda forward, but in the service of answering these questions that are really important uh, to patients and clinicians and other stakeholders. So it's, it's a pretty neat um, initiative. We were uh, lucky enough to get an initial uh, grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to get the network off the ground. Uh, we, uh, uh, we're building our website now. Uh, we plan to have our first annual virtual meeting in January uh, where we'll bring together virtually researchers. And another big part of the initiative is to really um, uh, support training. So we, we uh, um, provide uh, a way of getting the next generation of researchers and really sort of inculcating them in the notion that research involves knowledge translation from the very beginning and thinking about what are the important questions uh, and trying to get uh, academics a little bit out of the ivory tower that we tend to live in at times and and really engage with the community in terms of how can we how can we answer the questions that matter you know it almost feels like in lay terms that you're putting together this task force and we're really excited to see what the ccn does going forward and we thank you for for sharing all of that. So I'm gonna move things over to Stephanie Cal, who knows a thing or two about bringing people together in a harmonized effort. Um, you led Parachute Canada's Harmonization Concussion Project. And for the people out there who aren't familiar with this, this was the first effort that our nation had to have a consistent language for concussion recovery. So can you kind of rock, walk us through what the purpose behind this project was and some of the results you found from it? Absolutely. And A++ for the segue. I love it. I love themes. Um, <laughs> uh, the Concussion Harmonization Project began in 2016 and, and was really responding to the fact that um, concussion was gaining more and more spotlight. Um, there's a lot more effort to address concussion, but um, there wasn't, this wasn't happening in a consistent way across the country. There wasn't a common approach. And in some cases, there wasn't always an evidence-based approach and, and some misinformation. Um, and so there was a recognition that there needed to be some leadership um, to take the best information we had from research and from Canadian experts and use it to help all Canadians understand the best way to recognize and manage concussion. And this was, you know, we have organizations like ONF and others that are focusing on providing clinical guidelines for health professionals. But who else needs to know about concussion? Who else can play a role? And when it comes particularly to recognition, everyone can play a role parents, friends, coaches, officials, teachers, you name it, we can, if we all have this information, we can all act better. And we know that with concussion, time does matter. Recognizing the injury, getting people, you know, assessed and cared for and supported with what they need makes a big difference with this injury. So um, this is where Parachute got involved. Um, through this process, we were really able to make real world real world impact by changing policies and protocols with um, national sport organizations and moving beyond actually that level to provincial and community levels to um, train health professionals, provide them with updated evidence-based best practice through the concussion awareness training tool for medical professionals. Um, and then also have impact in, in other areas like schools and bringing information to the general public to empower people to understand the injury a little bit more um, and understand uh, you know, how they can recognize um, and ask the right questions about getting good help and getting good support um, for, for support and recovery. Awesome. And, and these protocols are still being widely used by sport organizations, by school boards, and we have them up on our website as well. And, and Stephanie, we talked a lot about it in, in our board meetings that these, this is an incredible resource. This is an incredible tool for people to use. But when you're going through the stages, you kind of have to have this awareness of your symptoms and, and it's kind of this common theme that goes with concussions is that you kind of have to be open about what you're going through and so when we started heads up three years ago i mean we've seen an incredible uptake in the amount of people that are contributing to this effort and you've been a part of injury prevention for nearly a decade now 
what is you what have you seen as the biggest shift in you know the concussion knowledge translation it's to be honest it's it's night and day um when i began um, an injury prevention concussion was not a common topic of conversation or focus there were a few groups that focused specifically on that um uh, one of the groups that actually became part of parachute uh, think first started by Dr. Charles Tatter was one of those groups that focused on brain and spinal cord injury. Um, but as a field, as a whole, it wasn't a big topic of discussion. Um, we did see, um, and I can say personally, I saw a, an absolute shift when there was more media spotlight, particularly following Sidney Crosby's concussions. Suddenly, it was a topic of conversation and there was a lot more effort put into addressing it. So I would say even just the amount of focus and information out there um, it is drastically different than it would have been, you know, less than 10 years ago, I would say. Um, the other piece that's exploding is, is the research itself. Um, you know, the amount of research coming out each month, each year being published about concussion now is at unprecedented levels. Um, what that means is um, we have more information to make decisions on, so that's great because the more we can add good quality evidence, um, the more the guidelines and information that we produce, we can have more confidence um, in them. However, it also means from a knowledge translation perspective and staying up to date, um, we do have to stay current with the evidence. Um, previously, um, you know, there's, there's an uh, international consensus conference um, that gathers all the current evidence of, and research about concussion, and it's every four years. And um, there used to be, you know, four years used to be, you know, not that long a time and not a ton of research in between. But now, you know, just in a year after a consensus conference is, is held, um, the research is constantly shifting. So we, um, all of us, have to be open um, to looking at the evidence and watching it shift and being willing to um, change our information, adjust our approach as the evidence guides us. And, th and that's a really important part. So sometimes for the public, it can be a little confusing. You know, before you said rest was the cure and you need to stay in a dark room. Now you're telling me maybe that's not the best approach. And understanding that the reason we're changing this information and trying to communicate it is because of the research changing and we're just trying to do the best with the current information that we have. Um, and, and, you know, as a result, I think knowledge translation is being more and more recognized as an important part that, um, you know, it's one thing to do the research, but then how do we make the research have real world impact? And to see a couple of massive research efforts in Canada, um, the Canadian Concussion Network, as Keith described, and then also the Shred Concussion Project um, that, that's funded and is taking place all across Canada, looking at concussion in high school students. Um, it's phenomenal to see this and to anticipate what great information we're going to have moving forward to make even better decisions. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and it's crazy, like you mentioned, to see how far we've come. But we do know that there's still a lot more that we need to do in this field. So I'm going to shift over to our other Stephanie McFarlane. And you're an occupational therapist at Holland Board Group, but you're also the lead for strategic partnerships. So you, you wear a few different hats. Can you explain to everyone what your role is at Holland Blue Review? Blue Review, sorry. Yeah, I'll do that as briefly as I can, as it is <laughs> difficult to explain. Um, but honestly, I, I saw myself in a unique position um, as I see children and families clinically, and I would see things that frustrated me. Um, more in terms of things that are outside of the control of the kids and families. So um, systemic issues, environmental issues like school and sports and just creating unnecessary barriers for kids, which we know affects recovery. As um, Keith was speaking to, there's so many external environmental factors that we're starting to understand that influence the injury beyond the injury itself. Um, I think COVID has been a really good example of that. Um, Keith, I'm not sure if you want more research on your hands, but an interesting um, concept really is watching concussion recovery in a COVID climate has been very interesting, um, mostly because it, it's, it's, um, there's so many factors at play that normally promote participation in life, which are now more complicated. So those types of frustrations and barriers made me wanted to move into a, a consulting strategic partnership role as well. So really what that part of my job is, is honestly taking the things that my panelists do, parachute, 
great researchers like Keith and um, a good example maybe would be um, like Roger Zemek's work in terms of how do we better identify, um, how do we create system pathways in the healthcare system when we early, when we um, identify kids in the emergency department who are at high risk for prolonged recovery. So implementing that, um, how do we make school and sport organizations actually understand the best practice guidelines and build them into their schools in ways that work for them. So it's a lot of implementation and change management um, that's sort of taking what we know and consulting with people to actually have it work at the grass level for kids and families. Yeah, and you guys do some amazing work with the GTHL and Toronto Soccer Association. I actually stumbled upon one a video where you were speaking to Ontario Soccer and going through it all, and it was really <laughs> extensive. It was really well done. So yeah. it's incredible what you guys have been able to do at the grassroots level and, and really implementing it. But you guys also focus on the concussion care side as well. So what is Holland Blue Review's approach to that? So Holland Blurby's approach has always been a very biopsychosocial model. Um, we really, when we're talking about a holistic approach to kids and families, so Holland Blurby's pediatrics, so we primarily work with 18 and under. We do see some people in our early care program between the ages of 9 to 21. Um, but really what we're trying to focus on there is seeing people as people, not just people with concussion. And the understanding of that is that people come into concussion recovery with um, a history whether that's um, a mental health history, um, a medical history that's relevant, or just a complex social history, or maybe there's things happening in parallel at the same time. Really our approach is understanding the whole human being and not getting too siloed in how we um, target intervention. Um, as some of my panelists have spoke to so well, we're, we're really discovering that the behavioral, psychosocial, interventions are some of the most impactful and it's because they're the most holistic and the most likely to address multiple areas of life, especially those non, um, those secondary factors that might be influencing. Um, so it's, it's, that's really always been our approach and we always work with what the goals of the kids and family are. What's the most meaningful thing for you? And uh, when we focus on that goal, it's also what is the difference that that goal makes in your life? And when you focus on the difference, I think that's where you really get the, the key ingredients to what recovery is for that person. No, absolutely. And like you said, it's about bringing the entire holistic um, outlook on the recovery. And I appreciate, I know you kind of just gave a little cold notes version of all the stuff you do and definitely encourage everyone to check out Hall and Blue because you guys do some amazing stuff. Now, I'm going to shift over to Natasha here. We're in this pandemic and as Stephanie mentioned, it's, it's tough for people who are currently going through a concussion because it doesn't hold up for a pandemic to get the proper treatment. And that's brought a lot more attention to telehealth, something that you actually been doing since 2017. So tell us a little bit about why you wanted to start telehealth in 2017, but also some of the benefits and obstacles you've noticed through your experience. Yeah, so back when I, the reason I actually started it, so I'm a physical therapist for an online like health and wellness community as well. Um, and what I was noticing within that community was it's a, uh, women were having issues or questions that were either exercise based or like tendon, general physio questions, but they literally, because of where they live geographically, they had, they had minimal access to a physiotherapist. And so some of these issues where with simple education and guidance, we're turning into more chronic issues. And that didn't sit very well with me. <laughs> and so literally the reason telehealth, that we started telehealth was to improve accessibility. Geography, my whole thing is where you live shouldn't be a barrier to you receiving medical care. And that's what was happening to so many people, especially you look at how big Canada is, there's so many communities that don't have access to the healthcare they need to have because it's not in their exact city. Um, so that was the reason I started it. So I started researching it in 2016 um, when privately and clinically not a lot of clinics were doing it. Like I spent, I don't know how many hours on the phone with different physio colleges across the country because there was no guideline. There was no standard. There was no one really knew the rules. The, the most common sentence I got, and I always laugh now because it's like, I don't know, Natasha, no one's asked us that question. I'll have to get talked to our legal department and get back to you on that. Um, so it's much easier now, <laughs> which is great. Um, but telehealth was a slow uptake. I mean, especially for, 
profession that I am, like as a physical therapist, when people think of how we treat our clients, they think about our hands and they think about some of the modalities we use. So for people and therapists as well, not just clients to kind of wrap the head around how telehealth could help them with their goals, that was really hard for people to comprehend. Um, so in between 2017 and March of 2020, <laughs> um, that was one of the big challenges, right? Was trying to, one of the biggest things is no one knew what telehealth was. Even across the profession, if you said the word telehealth, people had very different ideas of what that word actually meant. So there was no common understanding. There was no common language. Um, and then the second piece was insurance companies. There was only one insurance company that was for surely funding telehealth at that moment in time. And then that just that understanding of how the heck can a physical therapist perform, give me physical therapy treatment through a screen like this because we use Zoom for telehealth amongst other things, but we use Zoom as our main like video connector. Um, those were the initial issues. When COVID hit in 2020 and across the country, we all had to close our doors. So my clinic was closed for two and a half months um, when everything happened. And so I, and I'm in BC and I think it was pretty much the same across the country for a lot of the people that I spoke to. Um, all of a sudden there was no way for people to receive their healthcare. And for a lot of my concussion clients, we were lucky in the sense that we literally pivot our client, pivoted our clients into telehealth within a two day period. And so everyone got to continue on their treatment plans. Um, I trained a whole bunch of other practitioners. So that's one of my other online businesses is teaching practitioners how to transition their brick and mortar clinics online to virtual services. And connecting people with those practitioners again because what was happening with our concussion clients is I was doing really well I was all of a sudden disconnected from my healthcare provider I don't know what to do I feel like I'm getting worse and this comes in with all those other we like everyone has said across the panel the other factors beyond just the biology right so COVID presented this really unique period of time where anxieties and other psychological factors are heightened across the board um, but now all of a sudden they don't have access to healthcare either and so it's presented this huge transitional pivot in how we deliver healthcare, how people have access to healthcare. I'm really excited about what that means for accessibility for healthcare for not for our concussion clients, but and honestly everyone. Um, yeah, it's it's something I'm super passionate about. <laughs> no, for sure, and it's that innovative thinking that I think we really need. And and I mean, it was very evident given the circumstance that we all kind of faced come March. And you've actually gone one step further and you've recently co-founded the Concussion Compass, um, where you bring a community of individuals who have all are on a similar path. Can you tell people a bit about that initiative and some of the results you've seen within your community? Yeah, so Compass, I could talk, I could, I'm gonna try and keep it short because again, like I can talk forever about this. So when you work with a lot of concussion clients, you notice some themes, right? Like we've all shared it too. Like, you notice the the challenges they share over and over again the what stephanie said both stephanie's stephanie cowell said too with um there's we're learning information so quickly and protocols are changing and the things we know that are changing that when someone with a concussion is out there trying to research this on their own there is a lot of stuff to sift through there are a lot of different professions that can support you on your concussion journey depending on what you're working with um, and so we would get clients that would come into the clinic that were just like at a loss. Like I've seen a zillion practitioners. I don't even know what's going on with me anymore. I don't understand what I need to do. But then on social media, I would get messages about the same thing. And so I co-founded Concussion Compass with Molly Parker. Um, and so Molly is a physical therapist out of the United States who's had her own post-concussion journey and has had a long road because her, her concussion was nine years ago before much research at all was out. Um, and Concussion Compass is literally an online community meant to support, empower, and educate people living with persistent symptoms. So we have mentorship sections where we will basically do a live Q&A like this and answer people's questions. We invite guest experts into our community to share what they know about concussion and their topic to help spread more knowledge. We use it as a, as a tool to help give people the education they're looking for without having to scour the internet for hours and get mixed up messages. We use it to help people guide their recovery. It is not taking the place of rehab in any way, shape or form. 
but it gives them the tools so that they can put together their plan and find the practitioners they need to reach so that they can keep moving forward. So, yeah. No, it's, it's honestly so incredible. And, and we know a thing or two about creating a community and seeing how it empowers others. So really think that's awesome. And I'm gonna bring it back to some group questions and then we're going to facilitate some Q&A with the audience. Um, so for you out there, I definitely recommend starting to put some of your questions and Ryan will uh, get that to us. But my first question for all of you, um, and we'll try and create order to this and, and go um, through all the answers here is, where do you see the biggest gap in knowledge for the public lies and, and how can we bridge that information for people? Um, so I don't know who would want to take a stab at this first. Um, maybe raise your hand. <laughs> I'll start and then you guys can take it away. Um, honestly, it's actually understanding and identifying still what a concussion is and how it can happen. I think there's still such an overwhelming amount of people that think you need to lose consciousness and you need to hit your head and that it's still, you brush it off and you keep on going. Um, and I say that like we hosted a gala a year and a half ago and the whole purpose was awareness and education. Um, and in that gala, people shared their stories. So the power of what you guys are doing with the story sharing is, is so beneficial because we had people verbally share their stories and then we had some stories on, on the wall and no one at the gala had ever had a concussion. <laughs> um, and so the conversation that these, that our guests stories sparked in everyone at that gala and the emails that I got after was Natasha, I had no idea. I didn't realize a concussion didn't last more than a few days. I didn't realize that it could involve these things. I didn't realize that it was this impactful. And I think there is still just this general, it's getting way better, but amongst the general public, I think that there is just still a lack of what a concussion is, how it happens and how, can it, how it can affect your life. Awesome, anyone else want to add to that? Keith, I see that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you can, there are still a lot of unanswered questions about concussion and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Natasha's point's well taken that, that we're still struggling to try to find, a, you know, a way of identifying concussion that's less dependent on just asking somebody, how do you feel now that you, you've gotten a bonk to the head or a blow to the body? Uh, and we're getting there. There's some indication that, and I wouldn't be surprised in the next five to 10 years if we develop some biomarkers that really are fairly accurate and give us a better sense of whether someone's had a concussion. I would still contend though, the thing that we know the least about is how to treat concussion. I saw on the, on the chat, you know, a question of, well, these guys are all great. They're talking about research or other things, but what do we actually do to treat concussion? And and, uh, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to talk about the other stuff because we know more about it than we sometimes do it about treatment. Um, and, and I think we know of things that seem to help. We think certain forms of physiotherapy can be helpful. Uh, we, we know that treating headache is important because headache is such a big, uh, a big symptom and, and there are proven treatments for headache. Uh, but um, I think there's still a real gap in trying to figure out Kind of building on what Natasha said, what's the concussion, how it's being expressed in this patient? Because the symptom profiles are so variable. Uh, you know, some people it's it's headache, some people it's dizziness, some people it's it's uh, sleep problems, others it's uh, uh, cognitive sort of slowing and fogginess, and it varies so much. And, and I think the field's trying to figure out: do we need to target each one of those symptoms or? Uh, with specialized treatments, or are there one size fits all types of interventions that'll work? You know, we're increasingly um, seeing that exercise, uh, when done the right way, really can promote recovery. Uh, you know, we've moved away from the keep people in a dark room for 30 days at a time, but you know, that still happens. And this goes to Natasha's uh, comments. I mean, it, it, it's not as if we've gotten rid of that happening. I still hear about kids who are being told to stay in a dark room for three weeks, and it's like, we know that's bad, um, but so it takes a lot of time to get research and and sort of advances out there. But but I think um, I think where we're going to see the field going um, is increasingly to trying to to find out what we can really do to either prevent concussion or or to help it help people recover. Um, 
Yeah, I agree with everything my panelists have said. And I think the other thing that I consistently feel lacks um, common knowledge in the general public is what this new active rehabilitation approach to concussion is. Um, yes, I think people have moved beyond the understanding of bedroom jail, but I also think people still have symptom-free expectations before progressing to low-risk activities. Um, so we're definitely moving in a realm where it's unrealistic to expect to be symptom-free, to progress to things that do not pose risk to you re for re-injury. Those are the things we do want to be cautious if you still have ongoing symptoms and participating in. But really, I think a big focus is what we're trying to understand now is a lot of the protocols maybe we recommended at one time for concussion were actually counterproductive to mental health. Um, so I think we're now understanding that there are some things we can really learn from the mental health field and a lot of those strategies can very much be applied here because um, getting a good sleep, getting exercise, engaging in meaningful cognitive activity are things that will promote well-being and will promote symptoms. So I think that's one of the first fold big things that's a big gap in knowledge. The second, which is kind of complex to understand, but Concussion symptoms are still nonspecific. And what I mean by that is they're not specific to concussion. They cross many other types of diagnoses and conditions. So the reality is, is that we're, when we're dealing with concussion, there's also so many other factors at play that may be causing those symptoms. So some conversations that I get in with a lot of my clients, which I'm hoping to get more into the general public is, there are things concussions cause, but there are also things concussions uncover. And those are two different things. Um, and really starting to understand what those might be, I think can really help people through recovery. I think sometimes we box people into a concussion world too much when maybe um, there are some more broader approaches that we can take that are just looking after someone's well being at the end of the day. Hopefully that made sense. It's pretty uh, broad. <laughs> no, it was great. Stephanie is the, the master at taking super complicated concepts and just distilling them in brilliant ways. I, I always love listening to her speak. Um, you know, moving from the, the care realm into sort of broader public knowledge, um, we are seeing the persistence of, of certain myths that keep hanging around. Um, one of them uh, would be that um, this is just a sport injury and something for sport to deal with. Absolutely not the case. You know, talking about holistic, you take your brain everywhere, hopefully. Um, so there's lots of different activities where your brain could be impacted and also lots of activities that can impact um, how you're feeling if you have concussion symptoms. Um, so understanding the, you know, the holistic nature of the person and that, you know, different ways that the brain can actually be impacted. Um, I work in the area of prevention mostly, and so there are some myths about prevention. The one that keeps sticking as well is the idea that helmets prevent concussion um, or that there is going to be some sort of equipment or device available on the market tomorrow um, that, will, that will absolutely prevent concussion. And, and that unfortunately, that's just not the case. I'm a big proponent of helmets. They do a lot of amazing things. They protect your skull. They protect you from many other injuries, but they aren't going to necessarily prevent a concussion. Um, on a personal note, um, I, I'm a living example of that. I took a softball to the side of the head. Um, I am quite positive that the helmet saved my life. Um, I was hit directly in my point blank in my temple. Um, I still did get a concussion, but, uh, but um, you know, was thankful the helmet was there for other things. So, so being aware of that, being aware that it, affect, it can affect anyone, affect all ages, um, I, I think is a really important information. Um, you know, uh, public opinion research conversations keep reinforcing that these myths persist. And so, you know, we are going to continue to hammer these messages. Sometimes as people that are out there educating and giving presentations and writing, uh, writing articles about this stuff for the general public, sometimes we get tired of saying the same messages or we think, oh, people already know that. But there are certain messages we have to keep driving home. Every single presentation I give, I, I reinforce that concussion is a brain injury. Um, and there are some other key messages I have to reinforce every single time. Yeah, I think it's uh, it was one of the most shocking things that, you know, I feel like I can speak for Ryan here as well, that we found being in this field of work was that people couldn't resonate, you know, how impactful this injury is. Like, I would tell people that I had mental health problems, and for them, that was like, how is that possible? 
And so there are these, still these myths. I remember in my recovery, uh, my mom woke me up every hour because that's just what we were told. Like we didn't know any better. So it's great that we've come a long way and have learned um, that these don't work and they actually don't help with the full recovery. But for a lot of people, and, and we've heard stories um, that people share with us, is they go to their family physician or they feel like they need to go to the emergency room when they hit their head. And, and the early diagnosis is such a crucial aspect. So how do we ensure people are getting the proper care right when they actually feel any of the symptoms or they get any incident to the head? And again, maybe we'll raise our hand to figure out who wants to approach this conversation first. I will go, but if someone else wants this, wants to start, go for it. <laughs> um, this is just something I preach about all the time, right? So I work a lot with youth hockey players. I work, my son, my son is only six, but like he races BMX. So I see a lot of BMX riders. And my big thing is always like, your general practitioners are wonderful human beings. They are a general practitioner. That is their job. They have to have a lot of information or a little bit of information about a lot of different things to know how to help guide you to someone who might have more information, who has focused their practice on it, their studies or their practice on a specific area. So my big thing is, is always whether, because we don't know, we know concussion can have this effect on us. We don't always recognize all the symptoms. Like one of the myths that we talk about is people still think you need to just be dizzy and puking to be a concussion. And if you don't feel dizzy and you're not vomiting and you don't have a headache, you don't have a concussion, right? We know there's so many other symptoms that accompany this diagnosis. And then what the research is showing us more and more and more is this guided gradual reintroduction of exercise and life is so important in the acute rehabilitation stage. The other piece our research keeps showing us is just because you're symptom free after four days doesn't mean your brain is recovered. And so that's still where like, and parachutes, I use the parachute guidelines all the time. <laughs> um, this is where the parachute guidelines too, like they have return to work, return to play, return to activity, return to sport. Um, because regardless, it's a gradual reintroduction to life. And I'd always say to people, I would rather you see somebody, and this is what we talk about in Compass a lot, is you need to ask the questions. Do you have experience working with concussion? If you don't, find someone who does. Because you that reintroduction of life, reintroduction of exercise, all those things needs to be done properly so that you're not overtaxing that nervous system and overtaxing the demands of the brain and all that stuff too soon, because that is one of the issues that could potentially lead to more of those persistent symptoms. So I'm huge on, yes, go to your general practitioner, but seek out someone who is experienced in working with concussion. And like physical therapy is a huge piece of that. There's occupational therapists that are, do that a ton of that. There's athletic trainers who have extra training in it, but find someone beyond just your GP who can help guide you appropriately. Awesome. Does anyone want to add to that? I mean, I think that's all exactly right. You, you need to find people who know about concussion and there are GPs who know a fair amount and there are ones who don't. And, and you need to actually be comfortable asking them what they know about concussion and, and looking for folks who, uh, who have the appropriate expertise. It's not available in all communities, but there are communities that have good multidisciplinary clinics uh, and, and those are often great resources if there are persistent problems. I think going along with what Stephanie McFarland in this case said, um, I do think we have to be careful sometimes that not every patient needs a multidisciplinary big clinic and to remember that the majority of individuals concussion recover within a two to four week period roughly. Um, so we sometimes have run the risk of creating iatrogenic illness. There's a fancy word for saying, sometimes we made people sicker than they really needed to be by sort of over pathologizing the problem and not setting up expectations appropriately that most people recover. It's normal to have symptoms for a while. Don't get, you know, weirded out by the fact you're going to have a headache for, you know, you might have a headache for a week or 10 days. Uh, that's normal. And setting those expectations makes a big difference in promoting recovery. So um, I think you have to, it's very hard to come up with general rules, like, because it depends on the age of the patient, how long it's been since they had the injury, what are the, how are they presenting, what were the care, I mean, there's a, there's a careful evaluation that should occur, and you really want that done by someone who knows 
enough about concussion to help them develop an informed sort of treatment. And, and not everybody should dive into, you know, three different forms of treatment right away. Um, active rehab doesn't imply that you're, you're going to four different therapists at once necessarily. It really depends on the specific patient's needs and where they are in the normal recovery course. Yeah, just a quick add to that because I very much agree. I think there's a difference between going to see someone initially for diagnosis, which is GP, and that's what best practice is and also what um, is actually now a law in Ontario under Rowan's law to do. Um, but then if you know, you've know you gotten your diagnosis and you're still struggling with concussion symptoms, the, variety, the, the reality is, is that there's not a lot of interdisciplinary OHIP or uh, government funded concussion healthcare. That is like an incredibly hard thing to find. I think it's getting a little bit better now that most specialist areas are providing virtual care. But just to agree with what Keith said, sometimes, for example, if you're having a migraine presentation, um, there's no reason why that can't be supported by a migraine specialist. Um, if you're having mental health issues, there's no reason why you can't go to a psychotherapist or see a psychiatrist for those supports. If you're having sleep issues, again, not to, again to go out and shop for each problem, but sort of understanding which one is maybe the, the root cause of a lot of my issues. Is it poor sleep? Is it my anxiety? Is it my headaches? Um, these, we have ways of dealing with these symptoms. We don't always need to go to a concussion specialist for them when we're in the prolonged phases of recovery. I think it's important, important init initially for sure within like the first few days for care if that's what you need um, within the first few months. But once we're past that six month to, to year, I think we need to open again, not over pathologize or over medicalize or overwhelm ourselves because the other reality is well-being is not good being at three or four medical appointments a week. Um, it's better to be at school. It's better to be exercising. It's better to be at your job. So these are just some things to be mindful of. It's complicated. It's not easy, but um, there, there, are, there are treatments out there for these symptoms. They don't always live in the concussion space and you can talk to your GP about that. And to, to add to that as well, you know, the issue of going to the emergency department, um, you know, sometimes, you know, thinking about the role of the GP, thinking also the role of emergency department physicians um, and, and nurses is really to determine, um, you know, is your situation right now life threatening or requiring surgery right now? Um, and if, if they suspect you have a concussion, that won't be the case. Um, but they, you know, they'll be looking for, is, is there a more serious life-threatening injury, such as a neck injury or a brain bleed? Um, so generally, we do recommend people go to the emergency if they have what we consider um, red flag or emergency symptoms. You can find those on the concussion recognition tool or most information sheets about concussion. That's things like losing consciousness, um, double vision, not being able to walk properly, those sorts of things. Then we would say um, certainly seek medical um, emergency medical help. Um, if the, that isn't the case, then you know seeing your doctor as soon as possible is fine. Again, you know if if you are stressed or a parent of a child, um, you know sometimes going to emergency will make you feel better, and, and that's okay. We're human, um, but generally it's not necessary if there aren't some of those emergency symptoms. Um, and if you do go to emergency, always follow up with your doctor. Um, again, the emergency care is going to make sure that. Um, you don't have an urgent, urgent problem that needs to be dealt with right away and likely will, um, you know, acknowledge you might have a concussion and kind of send you on your way, hopefully with some good information, but always follow up with your doctor um, to get some more, some more support and care and information about what to do next. No, absolutely. Those were all great answers. And so, we have, so Stephanie, you actually just mentioned parents. So this next question is geared for them because we know there's a growing concern on the number of concussions in our children, our youth, and, and that's just going up. So when you're a parent and you're seeing this change behavior, naturally you're going to be worried. So how does the, muni the communication differentiate between what we tell the kids and the students to what we tell the parents? And does having a separation in those conversations actually create a barrier to the recovery process? I will start a little bit on the general communication and then I'd like to hand it off to my clinical colleagues. I know Stephanie McFarland, not to put her on the spot, has lots of experience um, helping parents um, and, and witnessing um, you know, what parents go through. Um, I would say on a general level, um, we always want to supply the same information to, to young people and to parents 
um, generally speaking. Um, we don't want to give different information and we want, we want openness and we want communication. Um, typically just based on, um, just based on age and understanding and what's important. Um, it just may be the depth of information that changes. So um, for young children, if we're trying to teach them about concussion, we don't need to teach them every step of the way, every detail of recovery. What's most important for them to know? We want them to know that, you know, if they do, you know, hit their head or get hurt or feel funny, that they should speak up and tell an adult. And that's what's most important for children to know up front. Um, so we'll manage the information on levels that way, but certainly, um, certainly it's important that we deliver the same messages. Um, now, in terms of managing and, and treatment, I will hand it over to my clinical colleagues to speak to that. Yeah, I'll just chime in quickly. Um, as I work with pediatrics, I work with tons of parents and I find one of the, I don't really find a difference in how I educate kids and parents, maybe just the type of language that I would use, but I find the most helpful thing to do to help the kid is to decrease parent stress and anxiety. Um, I find that to be one of the main factors in, and one of those environmental factors in um, prolonging symptoms in kids and youth, honestly, quite unnecessarily due to parental anxiety. I think it's very natural to worry. It's very natural to worry about something we can't see too, because we can't understand it. Um, so I find one of the best things that we can do is to decrease parent stress. The other factor about this, and this is just a reality, is that there's nothing, um, there's nothing like a concussion protocol to make a teenage kid or any kid feel like suddenly their parent has a lot of say in their life and a lot of control. Um, so that itself creates its own problems. So I think one of the biggest things that we try to do when we're educate people around management is normalcy in the home environment. Um, there are gonna be some things that are a bit different, but um, the less we can cause new problems, or um, other complicated factors that are making the family environment incredibly stressful, um, the better in the long run. Some interesting research has come out that both high and low socioeconomic status is um, at risk for prolonged recovery. I think that that also tells us a lot sometimes around, um, even though you have all the information to resources um, and access to care, it doesn't necessarily mean anything for your recovery. And I think that does come down to parental expectations, parental stress, and a lot of some of those other factors. I'll just uh, add to what Stephanie said in that uh, I think one of the benefits we have in moving to a more active rehabilitation approach um, is that we can actually engage kids in their own recovery and, and uh, take a much more positive approach to, you know, this is an, an injury you can recover from and you, you can really take some ownership in that process and so they don't feel like they're just subject to their parents anxiety and and commands that 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 and it's sort of a sports psychology approach in fact i used to try to avoid having anybody label me as a psychologist to a kid because there's this immediate like well i'm not nuts why am i seeing a psychologist it's like this is sports psychology because a lot of these kids are in sport even if you don't label it that it's like you can help yourself. You can help yourself get better here. And here's the things we can do. And you're going to be, you're going to be the one who really determines your treatment. And in some ways, take that ownership and burden away from the parents uh, because they may not necessarily want it either. They're, they're, they're often feeling uncertain. They want to, certainly they want to help their kids get better. Uh, but, but it, we do put a lot on parents. It's really like, Oh, you need to make sure your kid does X, Y, and Z. Man, a lot of adolescents, you can actually say you're the one who has to meet, do X, Y, and Z with your parents' help, but, but it's an active thing instead of, well, you just have to wait around in the dark room because that's what created all the, a lot of the mental health problems that went along with concussion. And Natasha, would you like to add anything to that as well? Oh, I think the three of them have covered it pretty darn well. <laughs> Um, I will say from like from the kids that I treat and you guys probably understand from even the kid, the adults that I treat too, the biggest thing that causes them the anxiety is that uncertainty of how long is this going to take and you know what does this mean and and sometimes unfortunately it's we don't have an answer like we can it's always like we know like 80% of concussions are going to recover just fine and as an adult within the first two to four weeks you know it's that piece of thing but for a lot of them and for the kids, it's like, how long is this going to take? And that, that's the piece that I don't always have a great answer for because I don't know. But yeah. 
Oh, for sure. So now we're going to open up for some questions from the audience and I'm going to pass it along to Ryan, who's been kind of managing all that. And then we'll get some Q and A's. Hey everyone. Um, so yeah, basically the first question, it's actually from one of our advocates, Brittany LeBlanc, and she's asking, what are some of the gaps you have observed in the school and education environment? And what could they be doing more to help guide these kids through this experience? Um, I can start because I work with a lot of schools um, to try and be um, to try and summarize it best, there's a lot of gaps, but I think what it comes down to is kind of two polar ends of a spectrum currently in schools. We have schools that um, I would say don't really have a lot still in terms of implemented protocols and, and accommodations and a set system and workflow for supporting kids. And then we have uh, actual schools who've gone in the opposite direction, I would say over supporting. Um, and I may not know that may sound kind of weird, but I'll, I'll give a few examples. So for example, we deal a lot with um, kids who have just been completely exempt from all tests and assignments and workload. And from what we even know now, even looking at the reality of a COVID environment, um, that's gonna cause sometimes more stress and anxiety down the road. You're just delaying so much workload that will be impossible to catch up on down the road. So there's still sometimes I find schools trying to balance this, this realm of, um, how much, like, do we either have kids participate in everything with no accommodations or we're going to make all these strict rules, they're not going to participate at all. So they have to find the balance between it. And honestly, um, encouraging schools that they have the skill set to do this. It's, it's not much different than accommodating ADHD or anxiety or all the other types of um, illnesses or conditions that learning supports and guidance are used to supporting. So I think it's working with schools to give them the confidence to do so. Obviously, this is all that, like you go to your medical care and you have that supported, but schools know kids best. They know them really well. They know their learning styles. And um, sometimes I feel like the schools just defer a lot to the medical community or wait for the next letter when we would love for them to progress and accommodate in the ways that they feel those kids can be best supported. I think one of the big problems in the schools for concussion is unlike ADHD and learning disabilities is it's so immediate. It's just, you have a kid who many kids are doing okay. And then all of a sudden they have this injury and we see that with brain injury in general, it's because it's a, it, the, the help has to be delivered right away, but the system is set up to take some time to evaluate kids, to provide care. And the time when kids may need the most accommodations in schools right after their injury. And often within two to four weeks, they, they may not need anything anymore, but the system moves pretty slowly sometimes. So, so school systems, I think, have to really work to uh, be able to uh, provide the assistance uh, in, a, in a little bit more rapid way with, with acquired injuries like this than they do with the developmental disorders. But I agree that the types of interventions you make are not distinct to concussion. They're, they're used with all kids with learning problems. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for that input. Um, and now I'm going to go to Sarah Wenberg. Uh, Keith, you actually responded to this one, but I think uh, I may paraphrase it a bit, but I think it's a really good question. So, um, so her question is, what are the strongest indicators of somebody that may be prone to having a prolonged recovery? And I guess my part that I would add to that, what do you do to adapt to that? And are there different variations in the recovery process? as an OT or somebody who works directly with someone? What are the different processes and how do you recognize that? Keith, do you wanna start with the delayed modifiers? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say what I said, which was that you know probably the best predictor of protracted recovery is how symptomatic somebody is right at the time of their injury. A lot of research and almost always the strongest predictor is how symptomatic were you acutely? So if you had a lot of symptoms right at the time of your injury, you're somebody who's at risk for a protracted recovery. Uh, but there are other factors uh, uh, that, that probably weigh in uh, as well. Um, and there's there a whole host of them. Uh, age, we, we think recovery is a little bit slower in adolescence than in younger kids or in adults. And teens in particular seem to be particularly prone to a little bit more protracted recovery. Probably older adults too, but we have so little research on, on uh, uh, older adults, so it's a little unclear. Uh, there is some concern that girls may recover more slowly, although we're not sure if that's that they're recovering more slowly or they're more willing to tell us about their symptoms than boys are. 
Um, you know, I think that's still an open question. So there's a lot of different um, factors that can get weighed into um, how likely someone is to recover. And it, I guess my take on it is that the ones that we can modify are the ones we need to be paying attention to. So, you know, we do think that psychological resilience makes a difference. You can actually do therapy to improve somebody's psychological resilience. And I think good OTs and good physios, whether they know it or not, because I've talked with Katherine Schneider and others who do a lot of it, they're doing a lot of what is essentially psychotherapy in their sessions because they're, in, they're helping people learn coping strategies. So we think about pacing of activity, for example, common recommendation from a physio, but that's also about a coping strategy. That's about thinking like, yeah, I'm not going to go too hard, but I'm also not, I'm not going to be too fearful. And that's, that's cognitive behavioral therapy from a psychologist's perspective. So, you know, what you do, knowing the predictors of recovery are important, but we need to pay particular attention to the ones that we can actually do something about. Yeah, and some of the other factors that came out of Roger Zemeck's work and are in the ONF guidelines would be like a personal or family history of migraine, um, personal or family history of mental health issues, or learning difficulties or behavioral difficulties. We've also learned that the number of concussions may not matter as much as how long it took you to recover from your previous concussion. So um, more like how long or duration your recovery was from a previous concussion is more of a predictor than the number of concussions that you've had. Also how close those concussions were together versus spread out with multiple years in between. So those are just some, some other factors. The other thing I would just add to that, I would maybe just use one example. So. A common thing that I see that has a big predictor in recovery is pre-existing anxiety or anxiety that is increased as a result of the injury. And I think um, concussion is sort of a, a perfect, um, not good relationship with anxiety because it is invisible. It expresses a lot of uncertainty. Um, so I take an approach always if I know I'm dealing with someone who has a pre-existing tendency of, of looking at things a different way or a pre-existing condition on making sure that that condition stays stable and doesn't affect the concussion recovery. So everything that I promote during recovery, I want to make sure is, is in optimal health of their anxiety and not contributing to it. If that makes sense. All right. Awesome. Does anyone else want to add to that? No, we're good. All right. So we're going to go to this next question from Sam. Um, how big of a factor is continuing to play in the game that you are concussed in, in or that you're concussed in, in the recovery process and, and just the duration? So if we can kind of touch a bit upon that, because this is definitely something that a lot of athletes try and fight through. These days, given the current protocols, you shouldn't be playing while you just had a concussion. So if somebody <laughs> knows you had a concussion and a coach knows you had a concussion, you should be out of play. That's the, I mean, the first thing is you shouldn't be playing through a concussion. And there is lots of evidence to suggest it's going to make your recovery slower. I, I talk to kids and I say, you know, you're not doing yourself any favor or your team any favor by playing while you're impaired. You, your reaction time is slower. You don't play as well when you're concussed and your recovery is going to be slower if you don't take the time to recover. So the best thing you can do as a teammate is to let the coach know you have the symptoms, get off the ice and start the recovery process. We have lots of data now to say that the longer you go, and I think Stephanie Cowell alluded to this, the longer you go before you're diagnosed and begin to get uh, managed, the more likely you are to have a protracted recovery. So we need to get people to recognize that um, and get off the ice or get off the playing field or, you know, take some time for a day or two from work um, and start that management process early. I just want to add to that too a little bit. The, there was, um, I can't remember, if, there was a campaign anyways, and it was a Paralympic athlete, for, a Canadian who said, you can't always expect a concussed athlete to know they're concussed. Um, because depending on what has happened, they may think they're fine. They are not going to remember that they've lost consciousness. They're whatever it is, they don't always recognize it. So as a teammate, if you see something that you suspect is a concussion or you notice some, that they're behaving oddly or they're not as balanced or whatever that is, as a teammate, report that to your coach, report that to another player, because as much as you're worried about making your teammate angry, you're serving them in the long run and their health and their safety as well. 
As well, in, in the moment, um, particularly, you know, staying in the same game or returning to a game to, or practice too quickly, we have concerns beyond concussion. Um, so one is, you know, Keith alluded to, you know, if you have a concussion, a brain injury, you are impaired to a certain degree. Your brain's functioning is affected. Um, so while you're out moving, that can impact your balance, your coordination. Think about particularly sports that are quick moving and that are physical. If, you, if you're not fully present and fully able and, and coordinated, you put yourself at risk of other injuries um, in addition to the concussion. The other concern um, is, is further injury to your brain. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons this webinar is brought together is that next week we are observing Rowan's Law Day in Ontario and across the country. Um, and if you're not familiar with Rowan's story, I, I really suggest you, you look it up. Um, we don't have time to get into all of it today. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, Rowan um, ended up um, dying due to second impact syndrome. Um, she had multiple hits, potentially multiple concussions. And when your brain doesn't have a chance to heal and you're hit again, um, there's another impact. It can lead to a, a rare condition. I want to impress that this is rare. It's not to scare anyone, um, but um, that, that leads to swelling and bleeding in the brain. And that's what led to Rowan's death. Um, so again, remember that your brain is, your brain controls everything. Your brain is what you have. It's your personality. It's your life force. Um, and so protecting it is of the utmost importance. Awesome. All right. I take it by no one unmuting that everyone's good with that. So I want to thank all of you again. Um, this was super informative and we really hope that everyone's listening was able to take something from this. These are four incredible speakers that really devoted their life to helping people with concussions. And you're all a incredible inspiration to Ryan and myself. And thank you again for, for being a part of this. We, we really appreciate it. And we had a lot of fun having you guys a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Of course. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate the invitation. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So we are going to change it up and bring in some hockey players to kind of grow this conversation and raise more awareness. And, and we're just getting a part to doing that. And I think it's a great segue from the question that we had from Sam because you know, there is this mentality in sports and in this naive way that we kind of look at toughness where you have to fight through these, these injuries in, in a way to help your team. So really looking forward for the second panel. Again, want to thank the incredible four speakers um, for people out there that, you know, are really scared about this injury. And, you know, it's, it's such a dark and alienating experiences. These are four incredible individuals that are really doing their part to help make a difference in, in your lives. And, and they're a living embodiment of challenging the stigma. So again, we are so grateful to have all of them just be a part of this webinar. Um, and I definitely encourage you guys to look into them more because some of the work they do, I mean, we only had an hour to, to really kind of go through it all is pretty extensive and it's pretty incredible. Um, so we're just going to bring in um, some hockey players. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Hi, Molly. I think Paul's audio isn't connected. Paul, is there a way that you can connect your audio? Bottom left corner. At bottom left. Hey, Dan, how's it going? What's up, Sethi? <laughs> All right. Paul, how's the audio on your end? So we'll still work to get that. I can't hear him on my end. Yeah. Um, so we'll work to get that. Um, my first question that I want to ask all of you, because you all have such unique experiences with concussions and it's led you on this path that you're on today. Um, so if you guys can touch a little bit about your experience with the injury and kind of shed light into why you want to raise more awareness. And we'll start with you, Dan, and then we'll make our way around. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Seth. Um, good to be here with everybody. And um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, TBI, with, uh, with suicide being the leading cause of death after TBI, um, I was really struggling after my career in 2015 with a bunch of symptoms that I didn't know why um, they were coming on. Uh, things like light sensitivity, slurred speech, um, anxiety, insomnia, depression, 
uh, loss of appetite, short-term, long-term memory loss, um, concentration issues, problem-solving issues, impulse control issues. And then eventually, after four years of trying everything that um, a lot of white coats told me to do, um, suicidal ideation, because I was in the hole a couple hundred grand and um, really wasn't getting any better. Found some relief for a few weeks here and there, but ultimately my brain scans and QEGs that I was tracking um, my recovery with uh, weren't, weren't showing any results or not the results that I wanted to anyway. So, um, you know, it was really a life and death thing for me. And I've had seven concussions, hundreds, maybe thousands of sub concussive hits. And, you know, I've had good friends pass away. Um, friends that have been shown to have um, extensive um, CTE. And obviously, I know that I'm at risk for that, because my um, Alzheimer's runs in my family and my grandmother passed away from it and as well as her three siblings. So that puts me even more at risk. So I've got to be super proactive and um, I'm just glad that I've found recovery over the last 13 months. And I'm glad that my brain scans have no abnormalities and my blood work is totally clear. And um, I don't suffer from light sensitivity, slurred speech, impulse control issues. I mean, obviously I'm human. Um, and we all have bad days, but my life has totally turned around the last 13 months. And so I think it's really important to share it um, in order to keep what I have. I feel like I have to share it freely. And that's what I try to do. And um, it's not for everybody, the path that I've chosen. And um, it can be done in conjunction with what the white coats tell you to do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's really um, because I almost took my own life and because now I really feel like I've um, recovered my quality of life and my relationships. I just, I feel very passionately about telling people the risk of repetitive head trauma and, um, and emotional trauma. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. And uh, I'll pass it over to Molly. If you can also kind of share your, your story and your experience and why you wanted to raise more awareness. Yeah, sure. First, I just want to say thanks uh, to the heads up guys for, for including me and, and having me on here. Um, anybody who knows me knows that, that concussion advocacy is a huge part of who I am because I was relatively young when I suffered my first concussion. Um, I was 13. I was training, playing hockey. I was a goalie, um, got hit in the head with an errant slap shot and the, the mask bruised my face. I was thankfully, again, I was young, so I was only out for a couple of weeks, but I, uh, I, I ran into another concussion when I was, uh, 15 and that was the one that really, sort of put me on the path of understanding what brain trauma and brain injuries are. And I was one of those athletes who got concussed in the middle of a game and didn't come out of the game because I knew that my team needed me to win. And um, what ended up transpiring was six months of an inability to think, um, a total change in my personality, um, and ultimately put me back in all sorts of different ways. Um, and that was what sort of catapulted me to start using my voice to speak out against this idea of toughness being playing through anything. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to be able to work with um, Think First Canada and then Parachute Canada. So I've been telling my concussion story um, for a lot of years now. And I, I really think it's an important thing. And, and once I got to, to play hockey at, at Harvard, which is where I spent my, my four years of university, um, we have this really cool saying about wanting to leave the program or the jersey better, better than you found it. And I feel really passionately about that sentiment. And I try and take that um, approach to hockey in general. And if I can, you know, if somebody happens to be listening and, and understands and, and it resonates, then I think I've done my job um, leaving the sport better than I found it. Awesome. Well, we have a few goalies here. Um, Paul, can you also kind of share your story um, and just why you want to raise more awareness? Yeah, absolutely. Can you, uh, can you guys hear me and see me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah. All right, perfect. First of all, I, I'm so grateful that I could do this uh, 
Uh, I had, um, from a hockey injury years ago, I had my teeth, the rest of my teeth. So if I sound a little off, I'm sorry. I had uh, six teeth pulled yesterday. Uh, didn't know till this afternoon whether I could do this. I have no teeth left. I'm getting my false teeth next week. So uh, I'm really glad to uh, to be on. Um, it means a lot to me. You know, my, my concussion started when I was playing able body hockey when I was playing at, uh, at 15 years old, playing AAA, and that's when all I really wanted to do. I, through concussion and a bad leg injury, um, my life really took a turn until I, uh, I was 37. I was just living, you know, an, a normal life, and at 37, I ended up getting an infection for my knee replacement, losing my leg at 39, and then at 40, I made the Canadian sled hockey team, and from 40 to 50, I went to three Paralympic Games, that's when my concussions really set in. You know, I had a story that I talked to Marty Berger once about losing my teeth. He didn't understand how I could lose my teeth as a goalie. Well, I asked him how many times you get hit in the head. He said, hardly ever. I asked him how many times he got hit in the stomach. He said, thousands. Well, his stomach and my face in sled hockey is exactly the same spot. So I started getting my concussions. And as was just said, my first real bad was in Salt Lake City. Uh, I took a puck right to the jaw, took out a couple of teeth. Um, they obviously wanted me to continue playing and at 42 my first chance to play in a Paralympic Games I wasn't coming out of the net there was just no way so I ended up playing through it uh, I played through the balance of my career until I retired after Vancouver and from the the stop of Vancouver Games in 210 until uh, January 30th 2019 I lived a life where concussion um, and mental health addiction and thoughts of suicide were almost daily. Uh, I had a long battle where I would go. I've done events for you before, Seth. I would come and do an event, uh, and everybody thought my story was great. And I was, then I'd come back to my apartment, and I would take as many pills as I could, drink as much as I could, and just bury myself because the, the trauma and the pain that I had in my head was unbelievable. There were some days I woke up and, you know, Dan was telling it, you know, I have Alzheimer's in my family with my grandmother. And there were some days I woke up, I had no clue who I was, what I was, where I was, um, but somehow I made it through. Somehow I went and I did my talk. And, and unfortunately on, on January 30th, 2019 during, and I have it, I have it right here. You can see on my, there you go. I put it there to see every day. That was ironically on a Bell Let's Talk day. I did a talk that afternoon. Uh, Every thought I but thought I was phenomenal. I came home and I wrote three notes to my kids. Um, they're all in their thirties, and I attempted to take my life that night. I ended up spending seventeen days in the psychiatric ward, where I actually, for the first time in my life, asked for help. And the last twenty months, I'm clean and sober. Next Saturday will be 20 months, first time in 35 years. And it's all, in my opinion, anyways, I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be. It's all tied in concussion, uh, addiction, suicide. It's all tied into our brains, it's like taking us on a, on a journey. And for me to be here and have the opportunity as a disabled athlete to tell people that this brain injury hits anybody everybody, no matter what you're doing. So I'm honored to be on the panel tonight. Thank you. We're honored to have all of you. And, you know, unfortunately, something that all of you kind of have as a similarity is that you've experienced more than one concussion. And whether it was through sport or outside of sport, did you notice a gradual difference in the symptoms as you started getting more concussions? And, and we'll start with you, Dan, and, and make our way around the board again. <clears throat> um. So unfortunately, the only reason I know I had five, well, seven total, but five of those, I just, I don't recall. Um, and that's within my career and it's, it's happened a lot. Um, it's not only the concussions that I have a hard time recalling. So um, I would say that the sixth, I remember the sixth and it was, it was bad. And then the seventh concussion was in my last season. Um, it was right after Steve's death. And um, I told the Blackhawks that I just was kind of done spiritually, mentally, physically done. And um, I ended up going in and, and fighting somebody just because I just wanted to feel something different. Didn't really want to play, wanted to get hit. And then the symptoms from that really scared me. Um, you know, 
rewind to November, 2019, I had my, my son, Austin. And so like everything kind of changed for me after that. Um, and then Steve's death and um, then this seventh concussion and not being able to look at your phone, uh, not being able to go to the rink for three or four weeks because of the headaches and the, the light sensitivity issues and um, the anxiety, the insomnia, it was, it was really bad after that seventh one. So I already had kind of one foot out the door when Steve passed um, and really when my son was born, but um, that seventh one really solidified that I was, I was done or else uh, I continued down that path. I, I just don't know how many more hits I, I had, I had left, you know? No, absolutely. And Molly, how about yourself? Did you notice a gradual difference in the symptoms? Can you tell a bit about what you kind of experienced? Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely noticed that the symptoms were, they weren't necessarily different, but they were more severe. So like I said, my first one, I recovered. I had, I had a headache. I was nauseous, um, but only for a couple of weeks. And then I started walking, skating, doing the return to, to play. Um, and I was only out for two and a half weeks. Um, that second concussion, again, I, I played through the end of the game, which was not my best decision, but something that you live and learn. Um, and those symptoms for me were much more severe and lasted a, a really long time. Um, they lasted a little over six months, maybe eight months. Um, I was extremely sensitive to sound and light. Um, I now get, I, I still deal, deal with um, headaches whenever the pressure changes in the weather. Um, and by the time I got my, my third concussion, um, I was already in college and I actually had to withdraw from school because I was completely unable to function. Um, I wasn't able to go to class. I, and, and thankfully, I say thankfully, it was um, really early on in the year. It was move-in weekend. We were, I was in a car accident and the, the academic advisor said to me, you're nowhere near being able to walk from your dorm to the, the class buildings. So you should probably withdraw and take the year off. And that was what I ended up having to do because I, I couldn't function. And that, that concussion took me the full year to recover and start feeling like myself again. But one of the things that, that I've started saying when I talk to people about concussions is there's no going back to what your normal was before your concussion. So the thing that I always say to people who are going through it or who are asking is you, you learn to find your new normal and that's what you learn to measure yourself against. Um, and it took me that full year to find my new normal and to, and to really be okay with that. As a self-admitted type A personality, it's a really hard thing to do. And I would imagine there are a lot of athletes who find that um, figuring out what your new normal is, is a really humbling thing. No, for sure. And, and we'll bring it over to you, Paul. How did you notice the differences through your experience with concussions? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as Molly and Dan um, could probably uh, agree on, I like I've been told over the years I've had nine. I've probably had 19. And I'm sure both of them, the numbers that they have in their head are probably way more. Um, I, it was just before Vancouver that I knew I was in serious trouble. It was a practice. And, you know, we had a guy on our team, Billy Bridges, who shoots the puck 80 miles an hour with one hand. And he, he caught me in the side of the head. I don't remember a lot about it. it. We were getting ready for Vancouver. I do remember throwing up continuously in the, in the uh, dressing room after and not wanting anybody to know. So just saying I wasn't feeling good. I might have had something bad to eat because I wasn't going into Vancouver my last games and not playing. It's just, it wasn't happening. So I would do whatever it took. When I retired, I, the first few years, I, I definitely noticed a big change because I had days where I woke up and I, I sat on the side of the bed and I wasn't sure what I, why I woke up. Did I have an event? Was I supposed to meet my daughter? My oldest daughter who has three kids now, I have three grandchildren. And she would call me and say, dad, where are you? And I, what do you, what do you mean? She goes, hey, we're, you're meeting us. And I said, no, that's next week. She goes, no, dad, it's today. And I finally had to start getting a book and writing everything down because it was affecting my family life. And uh, I guess the worst one, and that's when I really knew I was in trouble, was about six months before I tried to take my own life. I was taking a shower. I have one leg, so I shower on one leg. And for anybody out there with two legs, lift your leg up in the shower, stand on one leg and see how easy it is. I slipped backwards 
and I hit my head. I don't remember anything uh, to all of you. I don't remember anything except calling my friend, Carrie Goulet from Stop Concussions, who I do a lot of work with. And I was sitting on a park bench at the corner of Young and Front by the Hockey Hall of Fame. Have no clue how I got there. Have no clue what happened. All I know is he got me to see the proper people. And from that point on, I knew that I, I couldn't take that chance and hit my head again. It just it just wasn't going to work out. And, and obviously then trying to take my life, I've definitely learned a lot in the last uh, 20 months. No, for sure. Um, and thank you again, all of you, for sharing that. So throughout your recovery process, um, were there any modalities or anything that you noticeably felt helped you throughout your recovery, um, whether it was reaching out to people or anything more specific? And we'll actually switch it up. We'll start with Paul and work our way around to Dan. Yeah, you know what? I'll, uh, mine's pretty straightforward. It was, it was reaching out. It was getting the proper help um, from friends who really cared about me from the, the proper doctors who were going to listen to me. You remember I had a serious addiction to pain medication for years and years and years. And, and the doctors wouldn't, they would just make me happy. I, I, I remember getting guys, I remember getting scripts for 300, 400 pills. If we'd go to the Czech Republic playing for my country, I, it wasn't like when Dan played for Chicago or any of the teams he played for in the NHL. And I loved to, you know, just reaching out to you, Dan, I, I watched you a ton, man. I'm a huge Chicago Blackhawk fan going back to 1966. Brent Sopel, who won a couple in 10, he uh, he's, was my sponsor for a little while. So, uh, you know, nice, I, 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 looked in, I looked into a lot of different things. But for me, you know, we'd go away for 28 days at a time to play at the, in the Czech Republic. But travel, getting ready for that. I'd go to my doctor and say, I need 400 oxys. Give it to me like that. Um, so now being around the proper people who not just listening to what I want, but what I need. And that's a huge difference. Absolutely. And, and Molly for yourself. Yeah. I saw a couple of different concussion um, specialists. First I, I worked with Dr. Tatter to do the diagnosing portion of it. Um, which again is one of the more important things to do is recognizing that there is a, a brain injury. Uh, and then I, I worked with a bunch of different um again, concussion therapist, physio, I saw a muscle activation therapist. Um, basically, if it was within arm's reach and I thought that it was gonna help me feel better, um, I tried it and I found that there was, there was a lot of stuff that was going on with my eye tracking and with stuff going on in my ear that some of those things helped. But the, the thing that, again, nobody, nobody tells you about recovering from a concussion or a brain injury in general is the thing that's going to help you most is doing those things slowly and over time. And again, as a, as an athlete and a highly motivated person to, to have to just accept that sort of long question mark is a really tough thing to do, but that's ultimately what, what made the difference in terms of recovering to my new normal. Um, yes, uh, Seth, you know, we've had, we've had discussions about, um, and Paul, thanks, man. That's, uh, that's flattering. Um, you know, I, and I've been through two opiate addictions as well. And doctors used to walk up and down the aisle at the end of games and just ask you what you wanted. You know, we used to call them the candy man. Um, and they'd give you whatever you wanted, you know. And uh, so, but um, trying um, MOXA acupuncture, um, self deprivation tanks, a lot of functional neurologists, Carrick trained functional neurologists. Um, I found some relief, definitely. Uh, definitely felt pretty good for about a month. One of the things that they tell you at these concussion clinics is that they'll help you build new neurological pathways. And I believe that. Um, but for some reason, at like a month, two month mark, as I continued my exercises at home, it just, um, things started to drop off. So it, it really wasn't until I started to um, really focus in on my diet, uh, started to use uh, CBD and medicinal mushrooms like lion's mane to increase BDNF, um, reishi, cordyceps, uh, chaga. And, you know, if... Um, I know that uh, CBD is a little bit taboo, but I tell people all the time to look into it because 
Um, I've done a lot of research the last five years into, you know, what happens on a cellular level when you get hit, um, the chemical changes that can happen and the chemicals that get secreted um, by the dead cells or the dying cells and affecting the healthy cells that we have. And um, CBD is the only patented neuroprotectant on earth. And in 2013, excuse me, 2003, the US government took out those patents. So um, I, I implore people to go and look at it. Um, and it helps with um, that brain degeneration. And it says it all within that patent. So um, it is, again, something that I turned to 13 months ago. Uh, I watch my alcohol intake. I watch my white sugar intake. Um, I make sure I get the right amount of sleep. And then I took a huge dose of psilocybin and it changed my perspective on my injury. So Molly, I used to think a lot like you, um, that man, this is like, is this it? Like, the, you know, uh, it's been four years, four and a half years of trying everything that I could under the sun and spending all this money. And I guess this is my new normal. And psilocybin shattered that. It shattered uh, my perspective on my injury. And I feel better than I ever have in my life. And that is over the course of 13 months. And I've won two Stanley Cups, and I was apparently the epitome of a healthy individual when I was by far the sickest. And I didn't have any close relationships, and I was extremely selfish. And um, now looking back on my career, I can see why I played the way I played as far as that persona car bomb and just, you know, using hockey as the best anger management tool that I could. Um, but again, like, so, you know, it's like this perspective on our injury. And, and I know I used to say the same things. And now I tell people, don't worry, don't try to be that person you were before the injury because we can get better and I'm better. And, you know, Mike Hart said on my podcast, there's something is like called post-traumatic stress disorder. There's also post-traumatic growth. So like Paul and Molly and to myself and to every other athlete out there, if you're feeling hurt and you've played for years, give yourself a little time, give yourself a year, um, give yourself two years, give yourself the time to be able to recover and, and use these tools that nature has provided us. Because one thing that I never hear at these clinics is talking about supplementation. You know, we want to do the eye exercises and I understand that. And it's really great to diagnose through the eyes. And, and, and I, I implore people, if you're younger, to go because this, the treatment that I'm talking about isn't readily available yet. Um, but I also implore people, you can go to Whole Foods and get Lion's Mane that increases brain-derived neutrophic factor. And, and you can get things to boost your immune system because I had a lot of uh, blood work problems. Um, and, and, you know, your pituitary gland sits in a very rigid part of our skull and that gets affected and affects our hormones. And I had the free testosterone of a 72 year old male and it, ex it explained a lot of my fatigue levels. And that is all um, been equalized now, as well as my cortisol, which was three times as high. And that's your stress hormone because again, I was in a really bad place, but um, the story's totally changed for me, you know, and uh, obviously on social the last like three or four years, it's been, you know, I, you can see the anger and the frustration, but now it's just about getting this other message out that like, there is something out there that, that can help, that can help get us better. There really is. No, absolutely. So I want to take this time because everyone has their own unique experience and their own unique story to kind of break into some individual questions and then we'll circle back. And, and again, thank you guys for sharing those modalities. I think there's some really valuable insights that people can take from that and incorporate in their um, daily lives. So I want to start with you, Molly, because um, as, as you may know, we partnered with the Brock University Student Union and you kind of were dealing with, you know, you, you went home, you got your third concussion in a car accident and you had to take a year off. And so I guess I want to know is what was the, I mean, you mentioned talking to the academic advisor, was that the deciding factor or what was the moment when you realized like this was the best thing for you to do? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things to, that, that were at play that whether they should or shouldn't have been were at play in my decision making process. The first was I knew having had concussion that this one was worse and that I was nowhere near being able to be the person I wanted to be if I was going to stay at school. 
The second is um, there's an eligibility issue. I didn't want to lose a year of eligibility um, by staying on campus and not being in class or by trying to play and not being able to play. And there are all sorts of weird um, Ivy League rules that dictate um, eligibility. So those were the two main factors in, in that were floating around in my less than optimal brain at that point. Um, but when I spoke to my academic advisor, it became very clear that even if I stayed where I was, I was not going to be able to go to class. And that to me was the, that was the, the kicker. What am I going to do sitting on campus for eight months? If I can't go to class, I can't practice. I can't see my friends. So I'm going to go and I'm going to see the, the trainers. I'm going to try and get better, but what am I, what else am I going to do? And I was going to be by myself for most of the hours of the day when my roommates were in class and at practice. And so it became very clear that when I had that conversation with my advisor, that the best thing for me was to not be in the, in the physical space where I was going to be constantly reminded that I was not the person I'm supposed to be. And not that being at home was easy and not that recovering from a concussion is ever easy, but being with my parents and my support system at home and not feeling like I was just on the other side of a wall of something fun or interesting made that decision, you know, it, it was, th there was no question. I had to do that in order to be able to to recover and get back to what I wanted to do, which was be a student and play hockey. No, for sure. I think, I mean, when we first set up a table at Brock, we were talking to a lot of students that were currently going through their concussion, but felt like they needed to keep going to their academics. And I think what you said really hit home that being in that environment while you're going through that is a really hard thing to do. So I think that's a really important lesson in itself right there. And I guess what I want to know is, I mean, speaking of lessons, when you, when you were 15 and you suffered a concussion, you didn't really want to tell anyone because you wanted to help your team and you wanted to, you know, really be an impact and win. And you didn't want to let anyone down. Do you think there was anything that someone could have said to you um, in that time period where you were playing through a concussion that would have actually made you realize to take a step back and, and not want to try and, you know, force anything? It's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question and, a, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. but there's also, there's a, the, the saying for the, the Harvard hockey team is team first. So the idea is the team always comes first. And I love the, the camaraderie and the, the ethos that that builds within a team. But what I had to realize, and again, it only, it only came when I was much older, is you can't be team first and you can't put everything you are into putting the team first if you're not at 100%. So if you're not mentally there, if you're not mentally healthy, if you're not physically healthy, you can't be team first. So there's nothing selfish about realizing that you need to take the time to heal. It's the, it, to me, it's the same as if you, if you broke your leg or you broke your arm. It's not selfish that you take the time to heal, that you put a cast on it and you do what the doctors are telling you. But I think that 15-year-old kid didn't understand that I was not helping myself, certainly. I was not helping my team and I was putting the rest of my life on the line. And that to me is something that I don't think I knew or was stressed to me at the time, but the idea that I thought I was doing the right thing for my team when I really wasn't, um, that might've been the only thing for me at that age to realize this is not the right thing to do. No, for sure. And, and it's a tough thing, I mean, especially when you're 15 or if you're in, you know, in Vancouver, like it, it's a tough thing to try and there's nothing you can really say in an athlete when their mind is, I mean, so geared to, to that victory, that end goal. And then so a few years after your, your second concussion, you actually got asked to speak on the floor for the Ontario legislator for Rowan's Law. And, and this was a huge moment in Canada because no province had ever created anything like this. What was it like being on the floor and, and, and speaking for concussion survivors? Yeah, I mean, that was a really powerful thing. It, it was something that made me feel like I had gotten a little bit of control back, which as, again, as, as an athlete and, and a, a type A personality was really important, but it was also a huge honor that they asked, that, that the Think First Canada group asked me to be involved. 
um, they knew that I was more than willing to tell my story and speak out and that I had, um, that I was lucky enough to be at a school where my teachers understood what was going on, but there was still such a lack of, um, of general broad understanding that when they gave this opportunity to me, it was like, absolutely count me in whatever you need. Um, because again, anybody, anybody who's willing to give me a microphone to talk about concussion health, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm an advocate. I'm a believer that the only way that any of this changes is by talking about it. I couldn't agree more. And, and I know I can speak on behalf of everyone listening that we really appreciate you being so open with your experience and being willing to share your stories. So I'm going to move on to, to Paul. Now, Paul, you're, you're someone who's dealt with adversity your whole life, and you don't let that stop you as you're maneuvering in your room right now. But dealing with the head, that's, that's a tough battle. Like, that's probably one of the hardest battles you've ever pretty much gone through. How has your concussion experience affected not only you, but your, but your loved ones and everyone around you? You're, you're muted, Paul. Good. I can't hear you now, though. I was muted. Sorry, but you're good now. Oh. Oh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm 60 years old. I'm, I'm not uh, computer savvy. I'm trying my best here. No, I, sorry, I had to move around there. I had to go just check on my teeth, make sure I wasn't bleeding on camera. Uh, I know we've all done that. Maybe not Molly as a goalie, uh, but I, uh, it's funny when Dan said that about his, uh, the way everybody looked at him, he was so healthy, but the way he played, and I actually loved the way he played. I, uh, I did the same thing when, when I was playing. I, I actually led Canada in penalty minutes two years in a row as a goalie. So I, uh, I did some things now that I look back. I wasn't the greatest teammate in the dressing room, but I stopped the puck on the ice, and I think that was, uh, that was critical. But, uh, yeah, you, you talked about my family. Uh, it, was, it was hard for them. It was really hard for them because uh, I, um, I, had, uh, I had a lot of issues. I had a lot of... Uh, a lot of things that happened to me uh, um, when I came home, and my uh, and my my family. Sorry about that. I had somebody trying to call me. They don't know I'm uh, I'm doing this. Stuff. I'm sorry. Um, anyways, I uh, I had a lot of uh, a lot of issues. There. Uh, could we do sort of this? Could you go to uh, to Dan and come back to me? I've got somebody that will not stop calling me. For sure. For sure. Live live TV. <laughs> All right, Dan. <laughs> we'll, I'm uh, back. Get back to Paul in a second. I got you, Paul. I got you. <laughs> right so, under my wing here. So, <laughs> so Dan, in February, I mean, we had the chance to join you on the, your mental health and charted tour, and, and we got to learn a lot about you and your story. Um, and you're, you're doing some incredible stuff. Uh, you're representing your May Plant House from this newfound passion. And you're part of the decriminalized nature movement, the heroic hearts project, you're really doing a bunch of stuff in, in the realm of plant medicine. And I know you kind of touched a bit upon it and, and there's a pretty extensive thing. And, and to preface this, there's been a lot of science made to these plant medicines. Can you, for someone who's been immersed in it, can you touch upon about, you know, not only the benefits, but what you need to do? Cause it's not just a one all be all cure all <coughs> with that to kind of, get to this point in your life where, where you feel the way you do? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I guess I should say this is my experience. It's not everybody's experience. And I'm by no means telling anybody to go and do a schedule one drug. Um, I'm just telling my story. So, um, but that's something that I was pushed into um, because I had nowhere else to turn. And <clears throat> because I'd done so much research um, about the brain and what was happening to my brain, as far as concussion goes, and then I researched uh, or looked at the research out of John Hopkins University, the Imperial College of London, uh, universities like NYU about psilocybin, specifically a, a 2014 study that showed the right and left and brain, uh, right and left brain hemispheres communicating at a rate that's never been seen before, um, a placebo brain and then a brain on psilocybin. And I realized that these were new neurological pathways being made and they were um, stimulating brain regions that uh, specifically frontal lobe where a lot of my trauma, a lot of athletes, a lot of football players, hockey players, they found the CT. That's specifically where they found it. Um, and so that's how I 
I just, I knew that it, 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 it might work. Um, and you know, being called to like, my life's been crazy. You know, there's, there's not enough time right now to, to tell the full story, but I mean, everything happens to me for a reason and, and it's happened. Um, you know, I've gotten hurt and I've suffered and, um, I've also survived, you know, and, and I think that I'm here for a reason. I think that, um, this is my purpose, uh, of being here to just share my story, um, vulnerably and, and with, um, you know, just very honestly. And, and I think that it's an option for TBI patients. I really do. And, you know, I'm not quite ready to announce what else I'm doing with made plant health, but I'll just say that there's a biotech side to our company that's being formed. And, um, we are going to research this through an FDA process because, like you mentioned, Seth, like I, I do the decriminalized nature. I brought a resolution forward to the city of Chicago to decriminalize all plant medicines and fungi. And um, I did that because this saved my life and I want people to have access to it. And I don't think that somebody should be in jail for growing mushrooms and administering that it to themselves in a responsible setting. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I brought that forward. And there's, we talk about um, clinics and we talk about spending $5,000 a week. Some of these clinics charge um, $500 a visit. Who can do that? And who can sustain that for a very long time? So I am all about getting everybody different tiered levels of health. And that's why I believe strongly in decriminalized nature, because then you can, it puts these fungi medicines that the government should have never pointed into the ground and said, that's that's um, a criminal act if you pick that up. Something out of nature. They did the same thing with, with uh, the cannabis plant. Um, highly addictive, no medicinal value. That's what a Schedule One drug means. It's absurd. And, you know, I just, I believe that everybody needs to know about um, this medicine, that it's an option. And then if they know about it, well, how do they access it? Well, with decriminalized nature, it puts it at the lowest law enforcement um, enforcement. And so you can have the confidence of knowing that if you wanted to grow a monotub and administer the medicine responsibly to yourself, that you could do that without being thrown in jail for 20 years or 25 years, like uh, some people are for having an ounce of cannabis on them or some mushrooms. So um, again, I just, I feel really strongly about that. I also feel really strongly about creating a pharmaceutical. Um, something that good people behind me and something that I'm in control of for the TBI community, because let's face it, there's no novel care option, none. Right. And this is the first has the potential to be the first novel care option with little to no side effects. Uh, and it comes from nature. So, I mean, that's, that's my mission now is to, um, is to work with these medicines, continue to um, get better. I know I can get even better. Uh, that's the exciting thing. It's not like I'm plateauing here. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I, I just really excited for the future, you know, um, and, and just, it's been a pretty, pretty amazing ride the last 13 months to be able to be tapped in and be connected to my wife and to my family wanting to play with my kids, not having to worry about wearing glasses, going outside and, and just being in the moment with them. It's been amazing. Um, you know, it's been truly amazing. So, um, yeah, man, you know, I think, I think people should, should do their research and I say, don't listen to me. You know, I'm just trying to plant a seed and then go do your own research, please. Because, you know, there were a lot of times I went to these clinics and it was like, how many more times do I have to go to these clinics? And I know that I just wasted money because I didn't believe in the treatment, you know? So you have to do the research and then you have to understand it and then believe in it. You know, there's placebo and there's nocebo effects for sure. There's a reason that placebos work 71% of the time in these trials, you know? So um, I just implore people like you can get better. You can get better. You can get better. I promise. I promise. No, absolutely. And, and one of the biggest things that we're talking about in the first panel is, you know, this injury affects all of us differently, but the brain is just so complex. And, 
And, you know, there's so many stories out there to your point, Dan, of people who are, who are going to this psychedelic avenue and seeing incredible results. So these are all options um, that we're just bringing out and, and Dan's open enough to share his story. He's planting more than just one seed. Uh, if you follow him on Instagram, uh, he's planting a ton. He's doing some really incredible work. Paul, we're gonna circle back with you. I just have one more question for Dan and then looks like you're ready. So we'll get back to you. Now, now Dan, you kind of talk a, a bit about it in the beginning in, in, in the intro of this panel. Um, but this game, you know, it's given you a lot. You met your wife, you have three beautiful kids, and it's also taken a lot from you. And when Steve Montador passed away, it really shook the entire hockey community. And, and you saw what the repetitive head trauma did to him. Did seeing that, and, and you went through a dark time after he passed, did seeing what he went through, like, play a huge factor in your concussion recovery? Um, yeah, I mean, it scared me to death. You know, I watched him struggle for a little over two years. I had a lot of the same symptomology. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it, it scared me. Um, it still does. But, you know, I just try not to live in that fear. I can't, you know, um, I just can't. It, um, so um, I just, I try to get better. Uh, continuing on this regimen, this protocol. But Steve's, Steve's death definitely shook me. For sure. Um, it shook the whole hockey community. It wasn't just his death. It was Derek Bugarts. It was uh, Wade Belax. It was Rick Rippens. It was Todd Ewens, Jeff Parker. I mean, the list goes on and on. And again, like a lot of us have these similar symptoms. And so can we be proactive to stave off neurodegenerative disease? The good news is John Hopkins University is doing a study on psilocybin for Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of evidence out there that these medicines may be able to help with slowing down that production of tau protein. So, I mean, um, you know, I think, I think about Steve's death and I think about our friendship and I know he'd be right here beside me doing the same thing. But I mean, again, like he came into my life for a reason. He showed me sobriety. I was only six months sober when I made a decision to, to get sober in 2012 to save my hockey career because it was either get better, die, um, or continue, continue to play like after getting healthy. And so he showed me how to live like a happy, healthy life, you know, a sober life. And, um, I mean, he, he's given me so much. He still gives me a lot, you know, I still feel him beside me at times and, um, you know, at times when I'm meditating and uh, it's, um, we can't, I, we can't stay silent about things that help us. Um, even though like the, some of the stuff I'm talking about, the reality is they're both schedule one drugs and they could land you in jail for 25 years. Um, but what's the alternative? I wouldn't be here without it. I guarantee it you know, and, and I think that we have to scream it from the mountaintops because it's an option and we have to talk about all options because the reality is no white coat, nobody can tell you what's actually going on with our brains after we get a concussion. That's the reality. So you do what works for you, but I guarantee you, if you change your diet and you start living a holistic lifestyle, you don't need to be a monk. You don't need to sit on your bed and meditate and just do these little things. And if you're starting to feel better, continue them. And I guarantee you, you'll continue to feel better, you know? And um, yeah, I appreciate you asking about Steve, man. It's uh, lately it's, you know, he's come up a lot. So, um, but he's, uh, he's still around guiding. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you being willing to share that. Um, and I, I remember, I mean, it's crazy, you know, talking about people coming into your life. I remember reading the Game Change book and reading what you talked and how you, how you talked about Steve and, and then to be able to meet you and be on the tour and, and kind of know more about that story. Um, he was clearly an amazing person with a huge impact in your life. So again, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it looks like Paul's ready. So I'm going to, to bring him back. And, and the question that I asked you before, and I kind of want to just resurface that, 
is how has your experience with concussions affected not just you, but the people around you? You're just on mute. You're good there now. we go. Good. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I didn't uh, didn't tell my girlfriend what time I'd be on, and she kept trying to call me with my mouth. Everybody's worried about uh, you know I'm I'm not taking anything for the pain, and the pain was pretty severe. Um, so they're all you know scared that uh, you know, might I might you know, you know relapse or my 20 month uh, recovery for the pain I'm in right now. And I guarantee everybody out there, I'm not going to do that. First of all, I, I'm, I'm learning so much from both uh, uh, of my colleagues talking today. Uh, and I definitely at some point when we're done, uh, maybe you can hook Dan and myself up because I'm looking into the cannabis end of it. Um, you know, I've been told by a lot of people, you got to stay clean, you got to stay clean, you got to stay clean. Um, but I'm looking into a few other things. So maybe we can uh, we can hook up and he can educate me a little more too. Um, but yeah, my uh, my biggest thing, uh, Seth and everybody, was my family was, um, they, they were almost fed up with me. And, uh, you know, because I did so many things. My my kids were, even to this day, Seth, my, my 32-year-old, I have three kids, a 36-year-old daughter, a 34-year-old son, 32-year-old daughter. My 32-year-old has not talked in over a year. Um, she just is waiting for that shoe to fall. She's waiting for me to relapse. She's waiting for my old lifestyle to come back. And you know, I've learned a lot from uh, from uh, uh, soaps. Um, and you know, there's there's so many people that have been in our shoes that have been addicts for years and years and years. And you just can't just because I'm 20 months clean and sober means nothing to some of the people around me because of the things that I've done. I tell you know, I'm in the midst of writing my life story right now. And I tell a story in it that I'm, I'm, you know, I want in that my mom's dying of cancer and I'm stealing her morphine. That's how bad my addiction came. And I know it's got something to do with my brain injury. Um, so yeah, it, it was a, it was a point where my family and still to this day, I don't think they trust me. Oh, and it's really tough and, and with this injury i mean the brain there's a hundred billion neurons is when we get hit and get that repetitive trauma we change we do like our behaviors change and and it, it's really unfortunate that it's come to that and and hopefully and, and i know you're a very positive guy that you will find ways to amend that and i kind of want to talk a bit about that because you're really known for how energetic your personality is but you've been pretty open about the fact that you have off days and that is unfortunately the nature of this injury. How do you fight that inner battle of, of wanting good days, but having bad days and trying to make it more positive than negative? Um, I have great people around me. You know, I'm right now I'm with the, uh, the pandemic and, and COVID I'm living uh, at my sister's right now. So I've got my sister and my dad uh, around me all the time. We've got an incredible girlfriend, uh, who is also clean and sober. I've got a great addiction doctor. I, I don't hang around negative people anymore. I, you know, I, I, if you're going to bring me down, you're not going to be around me anymore. And I think that's critical because I wanted to try to save the world. I could never save myself. You know, I used to tell people I'd do a talk and they'd give me a standing ovation. I thought I was king of the world. And as I'm driving home, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what? How did you fool those people? You're such a worthless nothing. And I thought about this for ages. And now I'm to the point where I know that I'm worth something. And I know that, that I can help people. But I have to help myself first. Absolutely. I think that was very well said. And, and again, appreciate you being open and sharing that. So I'm going to kind of bring it back to some group questions. I know we're pretty close for time. We may go a little bit overboard. But this is really important conversations that... I think a lot of people who are still with us can still get valuable insights. So my first question is, how do we change the narrative in hockey at a youth level to, to make them understand that their recovery, and I know we kind of touched a bit about it with you, Molly, but that their recovery is more important than the game. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first on this one. I think the, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of different things at play when you're talking about changing a culture. Um, and I think it starts with what we think we model in terms of behavior when we're little. And that starts with what we watch on TV and what the announcers say about what they see on TV. I still hear things now watching the Stanley Cup playoffs that it boggles my mind that we're still using the terms like, you know, going, going hard and finishing your check and, you know, having your bell rung and things like that, where the, the announcers know what they're saying 
the players know what's happening and we're still just floating along like nothing's happening. And until we, as a, as a group, hockey, hockey culture, athletes in general, own up to the fact that we are modeling that behavior for kids, it's, it's not going to change. And I think that we all have to do what, you know, what we're doing right now and, and acknowledge I was part of the problem. I know that. Um, and that's the reason that I do what I do now. And I, I admire Paul. I've, I've known Paul for a couple of years and I've been following Dan for a number of years too. It's the reason I admire these two men because they're out in front of something that is taboo, something that is uncomfortable and something that makes them vulnerable and saying, this can't go on anymore because this is not healthy for anybody. And I think that level of accountability and ownership is the first thing that has the first domino that has to fall if anything's going to actually change. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And it, honestly, it boggles my mind and and stuff. If you're if you're watching any sport now and you're seeing things in the way that they converse about it. Um, so, Paul, Dan, do you do either of you want to chime in on this as well? I'll listen to Dan and then I'll come in. <laughs> um, yeah, I just you know the NHL took out red line pass or two line passes. And then the lower league took out two line passes and the minor leagues took out two line passes. And so when the NHL decides, you know, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a point now where um, it's almost like, I don't know how much onus is on the, the players now too. And the NHL PA, you know, um, because this is out there now. It wasn't, I, I didn't even know I was still in my career. I didn't even know that there was an NFL lawsuit for concussions because you just, you don't want to look at that stuff. But when you're under the NHL's care, which I was every time I signed that contract and I got paid and these doctors not only withhold information, um, but their job is to get you back with less man games lost so that they keep their job and some of them get bonuses. It's a problem. You know, um, when, when teams, their sponsors are our hospital systems and it's not the best care. It's a problem. You know, there was a, there's a documentary done or an episode that dropped last night on, on pain by uh, Rick Westhead and uh, Kyle Quincy and Zenon Kanopka and Ryan Kessler were on talking about this, their quality of life. Now it's not good. You know, um, not a lot of guys are really like excelling after their careers. And that's an issue, you know, and, I know a lot of the guys say, well, uh, if I knew, I would have done it again, you know, and it's, it's like, really? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know if I could say that at 21, maybe, you know, but 25, 26, 27, I, I would hope that um, I would start questioning more. And that's, that is what happens, you know, at 25, you just, you look around and you realize that this isn't right and you start to question it. You have five years under your belt so you can ask questions because as a young guy, you can't. Um, and, and then you start to stand up for yourself because the reality is in, a, in professional sports and as kids, if there's a coach that's pushing you back or pushing you to, to get back in the game and you know you're hurt, um, professional sports, I think, is a lot different than, than minor hockey, you know, and you have to tell your parents, and, and parents are attentive, you know, they sit right behind the bench, and you know if your kid is hurt or not, and children can't make these decisions for themselves, and it's really hard for professionals to make it for themselves, so that's why the onus is on these team officials and doctors and people that need to tell you, hey, buddy, you're, you're dinged up, you know, and you know, oh, you have blood on your jersey. Let me grab your jersey. You don't give the jersey back. You don't let the guy go in. I don't care what, you, what he says or, or how many sticks he breaks. We can't make those decisions for ourselves. And so that's where the, the most frustrating part comes in for me. And you see these ads on Twitter, like, pay the price for the Stanley Cup. I mean, I'll tell you right now, like, like Jim Carrey says about being famous and having millions of dollars, it's not all it's cracked up to be you know i mean i sit here today and what's the point of having my name engraved on a piece of tin that represents a league that doesn't want to take care of their players it means nothing to me you know so um kids speak up 
you've got a lot of life to live. 0.01% of you are going to make a paycheck playing this sport. Let that sink in. All right. And these officials at Hockey Canada and the OHL and overseeing minors do a better job, you know, or we'll just have to continue to roast you and um, name you and um, you'll continue to get lawsuits filed against you. And, um, you know, I really, truly think that change comes when you take money from these people and they lose money. This is, it's, it's all they care about, you know? So, um, that's what I hope happens with Steve Monitor's case. You know, I really do believe that he has the potential to change the whole world as we look at sport related concussion, because there's no such thing. Just like Molly didn't call her concussion a, a car accident concussion or a car accident related concussion. It's just a concussion and a concussion's a brain injury and it affects you. So just be careful. And, you know, I think the three, the two other people in, um, on this panel are living proof that you have to be careful. Um, and if you're not, then, then bad things can happen, you know? No, for sure. Um, very well said. Uh, Paul, I'll let you chime in as well here. It's on mute. You're still on mute. Oh, there you go. Right there? I'm there? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know what? Um, first of all, Tess, I want to thank you so much for, uh, it's hard to say that with no teeth. Um, like Molly's incredible. Uh, every time I, I have a chance to hear her, just unbelievable. And uh, other than watching Dan, I've never had a chance to listen to him. And I have learned so much, man. I'm 60 years old, but I'm telling you, I feel like I'm 18 right now. I've learned so much. Uh, you know, for me, I, I was a rookie at 40 years old. You remember, I made the pair. So I'm going to speak on the para level right now. I made the para hockey team at 40 years old. And, you know, Hockey Canada is there. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to the Olympics. I'm 40 years old, uh, you know, 42. And, and so I just did anything. I did anything. I listened to anything. I didn't care about. And, you know, I've asked this question a lot. We won the gold medal in Torino in 2006. So the first time ever won. Canada hasn't won since. The American dominates the game. Um, and, you know, it was the first ever shattered in the history of the game. Shannon Zabados got one after, and then Kerry Price got one. Mine's the first one ever. And as a 46-year-old para-athlete, nobody has a clue. They all know Zabados, and they all know Price. So there's parts of it that, that really piss me off that the, the para game hasn't got that recognition. But, but here's what really bothers me. I do the commentary now for the CBC, TSN, and for the IPC. I was doing the world championship, guys, just to Molly, Dan, and you, and everybody listening. And there was a hit, 9,000 people watching the game of Strava, Czech Republic, Dominic Hasek sitting beside me. It's his hometown. One of the Czech players gets absolutely killed, elbow to the head. If you know the game of sled, we're down very low. It was vicious. And my play-by-play -play guy is like, and you can't shush me when it's live. You can't shush me. You can fire me, but you can't shush me. And I went nuts. A disc is ridiculous, and this has got to be out of the game. And it went crazy. And uh, when the game ended and we're walking down to the media room, I walked into the referee's room, and I, there was very few refs that ever liked me because I didn't care. Give me two, give me ten, throw me out. But you're going to listen to me. And I went in the room and I went nuts because they gave the guy two and five. And he came back in the game and scored a, a big goal um, because he was a big guy on the American team. And there was a lot of people watching this game. And I'm thinking, what about the guy on the Czech Republic who's laying there and he has no clue who he is, where he is, what he's going to do next week? We're not making money. The most I ever made in a sledge year was $18,000. It was ridiculous. Yet my life had to be... 12 months a year, playing for Canada, playing for Hockey Canada, making them a lot of money. This guy's laying on the ground, and that's what why uh, hopefully I'll be back calling the, the this year's Worlds were canceled because of the, uh, COVID, but hopefully I'll be back next year, and I'll be back again. But they will know that when that microphone turns on and something happens on that ice that, I, that happens, that people call me a hypocrite because in my career I never said anything. Well, you'll learn as you get older and as you see injuries and as you see people like Steve pass away, then you learn and you do the right thing. So call me a hypocrite. I don't care. But if that mic's on and I see something wrong, I'm going to say something. 
And kudos for you for doing that because it is so important that the messaging, especially, I mean, when we think about where most of the digestible content for people in, when we're looking at sports is when they're watching the games live. So to have that voice and, and to be open with that, like kudos to you because it is clearly something that we need to kind of be more proactive when watching these games and, and having that vocabulary change. So it seemed like based on, you know, that question, most of that, you know, changing the narrative starts from the higher ups and bringing it down. But I'm curious because we have, I mean, three, I mean, we have a professional, an NHL player, we have a varsity athlete, we got a Paralympian. When it comes to this toughness, you know, and, and there's been a lot more light shed on mental health in sports, but there is this dark thing because society tends to put athletes on these pedestals. But in reality, you're humans just like all of us, and we all go through this. How can we create more of a supportive environment in the athletes and, and kind of in our own communication um, so that we can kind of be there for each other in just all of sport? Just, you want me to go first? Go ahead. Just what we're doing right now, you know, getting Molly to go to Harvard and speak to the, the players there and to different colleges, and getting Dan to get into the NHL and speak to the guys in the AHL, getting me to go to the para level to speak to the Russian team and the Czech team and getting to understand that we're not pieces of meat, right? or humans. And when the game ends and 10 years after I finish playing and I'm six years old and I'm just praying that I'm going to be able to know my grandchildren's name, it's up to us to get that message across. That's incredible. I completely agree. Molly, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that the idea that, that both of you guys had, had the opportunity to, to make money playing this game and I didn't, and I still made that same choice, is an indicator of the, the culture and the way that we need to make that change and start talking about this thing. Because if you're not, if you're not making money, I wasn't playing for my country, I wasn't, making, I wasn't making any money, and I still felt like I had to keep playing because that was what made me tough. And that was something that, again, you only realize as you get older, toughness isn't just playing through it. Toughness is being able to I, acknowledge and vocalize and, and identify something when it's wrong. Whether or not you throw punches because of it or whether or not you use your words is a different, it's a different question. But the idea that, that toughness means sucking it up when you know it's going to impact the rest of your life is something that I am, I am such a big believer needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement with Paul and Molly on this. Um, like hockey and sports, especially, uh, you're going to hurt, but you're going to suffer. You ha you're tough already if, if you play that sport. Um, if you play hockey specifically, you're going to get pucks off of the toe and you're going to get slashed in the finger and you're going to have to play through things, um, through injuries. I think it's... <clears throat> Um, I think it's the big injuries that you have to just weigh the consequences. And again, it, I think it leads with ed education. Um, we know that these sports leagues aren't going to do the education. So we continue to do things like this. Um, you know, we continue to speak at other conferences and uh, we just continue to, you know, I don't talk a lot about like the guys that reach out to me and but there's a lot of guys that see exactly what I'm doing. And some of them have asked me to stop because it's scaring them. And that means I'm doing my job should scare them. So then they're going to think twice about the decisions that they're going to make. And they're going to think twice now about seeing Ryan Kessler who has millions of dollars and can't go and play with his daughters outside. You know, they're going to start to think twice about the decisions that they're going to make. Um, and that's all we can really ask for. You know, we can empower these guys who are current players and former players who are suffering out there to know that there's another way out and it's okay to say no and, and actually tell them how you feel. It doesn't make you any weaker. I think it makes you much stronger. You know, I think you're weak if you don't actually tell someone how you feel, regardless of how much money, like, I was making over $200,000 just shutting my mouth and going to Blackhawks signings. I could have done that for the rest of my life and live very comfortably, you know, and I just, my moral compass wouldn't allow me to do it, you know, and uh, 
it's just, it's, it's, it needs to change, you know? And so do we wait for professional sports leagues, especially this one run by a lawyer to change it? Or do you try to change it from the grassroots up? And, uh, you know, I think that we're getting through, you see guys like Rick Nash retiring and you see superstars retiring because early, because they're worried, you know, and you should be. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's so much to delve into on that side of, of concussion and brain injury and these doctors and who they work for and their conflicts of interest. But that's for another time. Just again, do your research, do your research and um, you'll be able, it's a simple Google search and you can empower yourself with education. Just understand who you're, what you're reading, who you're reading it from, who that person works for. And then you'll be able to, you know, either ingest it or, or deny it. Um, so, yeah. No, for sure. And, and like Paul said, it's, it's having all of you guys being willing and open to sharing your story that really starts to enact change and starts spurring some more ideas. Um, and so again, really appreciate all of you being here. And, and for the interest of time, um, first of all, I want to thank everyone that's stayed throughout the entire duration of this webinar. Um, we're going to be posting a lot of content from this because there's been some incredible conversations. So the last question I want to leave, and I apologize for the Q and A's that are out there. Um, we just don't have the time to, to answer all of it is for kids that are just getting into hockey or kids that have been going up playing hockey, what's the one thing that you can say to them that they can challenge the stigma through sport? Like how would they be able to do that? Um, Paul, you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Bob. Well, I, did, I didn't hear him 100%. You broke up a little. So go ahead, Dan, and I'll, I'll listen to you. Um, yeah, I would just say just tell the truth. If you're hurt, tell someone that you're hurt. You know, again, just keep this stat in mind. 0.01% of you are going to make a paycheck. So just have fun. Like, I started playing this game because it was really fun. You know, I love this game. It's the best game on earth. I hate the institutions. They need to change. So just tell the truth and you'll be all right. Yeah, I'll I'll go check and I say, uh, can you can you guys hear me and see me? So just enjoy it, enjoy the game. Um, you don't know how long you're going to play it. Enjoy it, but but realistically, you if, you, if we're talking to kids, your parents have to step in. You know, you're not going to make Dan Carcillo money. You're just not going to do that. It's it's so rare. But you want to be able to when your career ends. And you're going to have a family, you know, in whatever sense you're going to have the family, you want to be healthy. Okay. There's nothing more important than that. So enjoy the game, but think of your future. Yeah, I think, I think you guys both nailed it. The, the idea is tell the truth and don't sacrifice what you are right now for what you might be or what you think you could be. Because the, the thing that you're going to end up hurting is, is your own health and your own life. And that's, Again, that's, it's as somebody who did it, it's, it's not worth it. There are so many other ways to, to show you're tough and be a good teammate and love the game and live the game and, and take it as far as you want. But there's no reason to sacrifice your health at any point for a game. Absolutely. And thank you guys once again. Um, this was such an informative uh, discussion and I'm sure a lot of people are going to take away from this, whether it's parents, whether it's hockey players, clinicians. I think there was a lot of really awesome conversations here. Um, and we're pretty much at the end of our webinar. I mean, when I look at these three individuals who've all reached peaks in the, in the sport of hockey, I mean, they're coming together and, and really trying to raise awareness on this invisible injury. And thanks to you guys, we we're able to have these conversations and, and I know I can speak on behalf of our team here at Heads Up Can that we are super appreciative of all of the work that you guys do because you guys do have a voice and it's you, people listen to you and, and we're really appreciative that your voice is gearing them to, you know, take care of their brain first and, and it's such an important thing. So thank you all again for, for joining us. I really appreciate this. Thanks for you putting this on, brother.
Appreciate it, man. I, I love that suit jacket, little blazer. Oh, yeah. It was Looks a cool great. play. <laughs> yeah, man. Blazer team combo thank was a classic. Thank you. Classic. Professional I'll, I'll casual. My, <laughs> my, my final, that's my final thing. Uh, if can, you know, whether you're playing para ice hockey and you're disabled, or you're playing for the, in the women's game, or you're playing in the NHL, or anywhere in the world, just play safe. Enjoy the game and play safe. Well, for sure. A great way to end it because I couldn't yep. agree more. So uh, thank you. Thank you for the praise on the blazer. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, if you can uh, connect us all through email yeah, so we awesome. can exchange. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. All right, guys, cool. that wraps it up for our webinar. First of hopefully thank many. Um, thank you guys again. And uh, we're going to end this now and appreciate all the work you guys continue to do. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Thanks, Molly. All right, that's a wrap for the first ever Heads Up Can webinar. We hope you enjoyed your two and a half hours, almost three hours with us and took a lot from it. Ryan is still here. Um, so thank you again for being a part of this and thank you to all of our partners, our, our sponsors. This was a really exciting thing for us to be able to bring this conversation of concussions to you in a time where we can't all be together. So. Again, thank you, Ryan, if you have any final words. Pretty much the same thing. Thank you for everybody who was involved. It was amazing conversations and I think very informative as well. And uh, yeah, we'll continue the fight to challenge the stigma on concussions. You can know that for sure. <laughs> Always. All right. Thank All you right. very much. Take care.